Praise to be Jesus Christ. I must explain that through some uh, mistake, the, the gospel reading, which is a very beautiful one and uh, on which I would love to preach, is not the gospel reading on which I prepared my, my, my homily, which was the classic text from the chapter 19 of the, math, of the gospel according to St. Matthew on, on marriage. But in the, cont- in the text of my homily, I quote extensively from the text, which I'm sure is also very familiar to you. And uh, well, we put all of this in our Lord's sacred heart, about which we have uh, just heard so beautifully in the reading from the, the, same, the Gospel according to St. John. The teaching of Christ regarding holy matrimony contained in today's Gospel could not be clearer. It is also courageous, for it was given at a moment when the Pharisees were clearly trying to trap our Lord in his speech so that they could denounce him. Let us carefully examine his teaching, which is at the very heart of our faith and life. First of all, our Lord makes it clear that he is teaching the natural moral law, the law written by God on every human heart. He teaches what nature itself requires of us. What he teaches is a mirror of the goodness, beauty, and truth with which God has created us and our world. When the Pharisees asked whether it is lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause whatever, Christ recalled to their minds the two accounts of creation of the creation of man in the book of Genesis, the second of which we have already heard, uh, pro- heard proclaimed in today's first reading. Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. Christ reminded the Pharisees of the objective order which God has written into nature from the beginning. It is an order which does not change with the changes of time and place, as the Pharisees, recalling the Mosaic practice of permitting divorce, suggested that it can. It is, in fact, a great and imperishable gift, for it is a share in the very life and love of God. In response to the Pharisees' invocation of the authority of Moses to justify the practice of granting divorce, Christ made clear that Moses was responding to the hardness of heart which refuses to receive the teaching of the moral law and to conform one's life to it. Hardness of heart takes the divine gift of marriage and distorts it with selfishness and sin. Christ once again evoked the natural moral law with the words, Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. In other words, it is clear that the practice of Moses did not fully respect God's plan for marriage from the beginning, and that Christ, God the Son incarnate, purifies the Mosaic practice restoring marriage to its original holiness. Christ restores marriage to its truth, for if a man is validly married to a woman, then it is impossible for him to marry another woman as long as the marriage bond endures. To do otherwise is a contradiction of the truth and therefore gravely sinful. Christ then made clear the meaning of the divine natural law regarding the indissolubility of marriage and of its violation through the practice of divorce. He declared simply, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful, and marries another, commits adultery. Marriage is a participation in the faithful and enduring love of God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is in its essence a faithful and enduring bond. 
If a man is bound in marriage to a spouse, even if the spouse has abandoned him, salvation consists in fidelity to the existing marriage bond, and he cannot pretend to establish another. His calling is to seek the salvation of the partner, even if he can do so only by praying for her. To comport oneself in a marital way with another woman is adultery which the Church has always understood to be among the gravest of sins. The teaching of our Lord regarding holy matrimony is demanding. It does not permit compromises or accommodations. Clearly, the disciples understood the true meaning of Christ's teaching on marriage, for they immediately observed, If that is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Our Lord responded by assuring the disciples that he not only restores marriage to its original beauty, but also gives the grace to those called to the married life so that they may live the truth of their conjugal union. Not all can accept this word, but only those to whom it is granted. If the married give their hearts to our Lord, if they overcome the hardness of heart, which is a contradiction of marital love, then he never fails to pour forth divine love into their hearts in abundance. It is the divine love of which their marriage is a sign in the world. Today, as at other times in the history of man, hardness of heart would once again distort, disfigure, and attempt to destroy the divine gift of holy matrimony. The contraceptive mentality, no-fault divorce, pornography on the internet, sexual promiscuity, gender theory, and now the legally sanctioned denial of the very nature of marriage as the faithful, lifelong, and procreative union of one man and one woman are manifestations of how hardened our hearts have once more become. Sadly, the hardness of heart has also entered into the Church and is presently manifesting itself in a great confusion regarding the indissolubility of marriage and the impossibility of receiving the sacraments for those living in irregular unions. There is also the discussion of so-called positive elements in homosexual liaisons and in cohabitation outside of marriage, as if there could ever be anything positive about mortal sin. Likewise, too, there is a loss of faith in the grace of chastity, which Christ pours forth into the lives of the married, purifying and strengthening them to live the truth of their faithful, lifelong, and procreative love. These worrisome situations in the world and in the Church, however, must not become causes for doubt and discouragement. They must not confuse us regarding the love which we must have for sinners, even while we abhor the sin which they commit. Christ remains always true and generous in his love. Superabundant grace never ceases to flow into our hearts from his glorious pierced heart. Before the truly formidable challenges to Christian life in the world today, let us give our hearts more and more into the sacred heart of Jesus, who inspires us to pray and to do penance, to study our faith, and to give a courageous account of it to others, and to engage ourselves in the apostolate all on behalf of marriage and its most beautiful flower, the family. Let us now lift up our hearts, one with the Immaculate Heart of Mary, to the glorious pierced heart of Jesus, ever open to receive our hearts, most especially through the Eucharistic sacrifice by which he makes present anew his sacrifice on Calvary. Let us give him our hearts, so that he may heal them of all sin and inflame them with divine love. Only in the heart of Jesus 
do we discover the truth about marriage and the family. Only in the heart of Jesus do we find the grace to serve faithfully that truth as it is safeguarded and promoted by the Church's teaching and discipline. Most sacred heart of Jesus, vessel of justice and love, have mercy on us. Our Lady of Guadalupe, Virgin Mother of God and Queen of the Family, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pillar of families, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We've begun our day of reflection with the most powerful prayer of the Holy Rosary. We are blessed also to have celebrated the feast of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary on Wednesday of this week, uh, uh, celebrating the great victory at, in the Battle of Lepanto, uh, 1571, uh, owed, as Pope St. Pius V understood uh, uh, greatly to the intercession of our Blessed Mother through the praying of the rosary and, and rosary processions in the city of Rome, as, as he requested, while the battle was being waged. So if today uh, we rightly feel that we are also engaged in a battle not at sea, but uh, a battle in our, our very culture, uh, which threatens to, to snuff out the Christian identity of, of our nation and, and constitutes grave temptations, for the Christian identity of us as individuals uh, and as a church, uh, we ought to invoke all the more uh, the intercession of Our Lady. In fact, first, St. Pius V entitled the feast Our Lady of Victory, and then later, uh, rightly, uh, his successor changed it to Our Lady of the, of the Holy Rosary, but the two things go together. It's through the Holy Rosary that we uh, grow, praying of the Holy Rosary, that Our Lady uh, increases in us our confidence in the victory of Christ, who by His grace in dwelling in our souls uh, can even in our greatest weakness give us the victory over sin and eternal death. I will be giving three conferences today, all centered upon the uh, the Sacrament of Holy Matrimony and its incomparable fruit, the family. Uh, the first conference uh, uh, will address, in a particular way, the particular in a particular way, the crisis of the present moment uh, with regard to marriage and the family, which is identified uh, with the uh, Synod of Bishops, which was celebrated last October in uh, the Second Assembly. Uh, the, the 14th General Assembly on the same subject which is being celebrated at this very time. And I urge you today to uh, uh, devote your prayers in a particular way uh, for the, the Synod of Bishops. Uh, according to the Church's discipline, the Synod exists. It, it is a gathering of bishops from throughout the world to assist our Holy Father in safeguarding and promoting the doctrine of the faith and in uh, safeguarding and promoting the discipline of the church. And let us pray that the, the synod will indeed be that, especially as it is treating the subjects of marriage and the family. Uh, so I will, this first talk is, is with regard to the, the situation of the present moment. The second talk is uh, a catechesis on holy matrimony, which I have taken from the writings, especially from the basic catechism course of the Servant of God, Father John Anthony Hardin, um, who died in December of, uh, of the great jubilee year of 2000, who was a master catechist and uh, who uh, founded in a particular way an apostolate for the spiritual and doctrinal formation of catechists. And the third talk is directed to what I consider a, a most important subject, and I hope a subject which will be efficaciously taken up in the present assembly of the Synod of Bishops, the preparation for marriage, uh, given the situation in our time. 
In this first conference, I address the current discussion regarding the fundamental truth of marriage in the church, indicating the importance of the studies provided in the book. And this is a title, and if you have a pencil to write it down, I'm sure there are copies of this available in the bookstore. If not, it can also be ordered online from Ignatius Press, Remaining in the Truth of Christ, Marriage and Communion in the Catholic Church. It's a wonderful collection of essays that illustrate uh, the truth of the teaching on marriage, the church's teaching on marriage, from a number of different perspectives. Uh, and it was, ri- it was written to assist the Synod of Bishops in addressing the situation of the family, of marriage in the family in our time. And I will now take up several questions which are related to that treatment. Uh, I might say that the, the book, uh, once you read it, you'll see that it's done by people who are are very scholarly, but the articles are written to be accessible to the everyday reader. And in fact, I'm told in Italy, the book is translated now in something like seven or eight languages, uh, but I'm told in Italy that some priests are using parts of it for marriage preparation, and that would be uh, something to do. We need to, in every respect, uh, take more seriously the sacred realities of our faith, and above all, the, the sacrament of holy matrimony. The first uh, subject I'd like to take up is the current discussion regarding the fundamental truth of marriage. At the present moment in the church, there's perhaps no more critical issue for us to address than the truth about marriage. In a world in which the integrity of marriage has been under attack for decades, the church has remained a faithful herald of the truth about God's plan for man and woman in the faithful, indissoluble, and procreative union of marriage. In the present time, certainly under pressure from a totally secularized culture, a growing confusion and even error has entered into the church, which would weaken seriously, if not totally compromise, the church's witness, and that to the detriment of the whole of society. An interesting story was related to me last fall while the the synod was going on, especially after the the mid-synod report was given and there was this headline in the New York Times about the revolution in the Catholic Church suggesting that she was going to abandon her teaching, which is her her teaching because it's our Lord's teaching, on the indissolubility of marriage. a story was reported to me by a priest who was talking to a, a minister of a Protestant denomination who expressed to him great concern about the situation. And he said, he said, we abandoned these teachings a, a long time ago, but we always counted upon the Catholic Church to uphold them. Now, that, <laughs> it is humorous in a certain way, but... But what it indicates is that those denominations, those who claim to be Christian and admit the, the, the possibility of entering into a new marital union when one is uh, already bound by a prior union, they recognize in, in, the, in, the, in the deepest part of their hearts that this isn't true, that this isn't true to the teaching of Christ. And, and this... This minister gave expression to that. This is what concerns me very deeply. So many questions, critical questions of our time. The Catholic Church also, with great struggle internally, has upheld the Church's teaching, for instance, with regard to contraception and other teachings, regard to the the real presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. When other Christian bodies gave up these teachings and became ever more secularized and, and didn't anymore accept the mystery of our faith. And so it's critical in this time, especially on this question of marriage, that the church uphold her teaching. And that not only simply because it's, it's true for our, our own salvation, but also it's for the good of our, the whole of our society. The confusion and error 
It became evident for the world during the recent session, that would be the October 2014, I shouldn't call it recent anymore because now we're in a new session. During the October 2014 session of the Third Assembly uh, of the Synod of Bishops, the assembly dedicated to the discussion of the subject, the pastoral challenges of the family in the context of evangelization, found itself, and I was a member of it, so I can say this with a certain uh, authority, found itself addressing in a confused and sometimes erroneous manner practices which contradict the church's constant teaching and practice regarding holy matrimony. I refer to practices which would give access to the sacraments to those who are living in a public state of adultery and which would condone in some manner conjugal cohabitation outside of the sacrament of matrimony and genital relations between persons of the same sex. The report given at the midpoint of the synod made strikingly clear the gravity of the situation. The report itself, which lacked practically any consistent reference to the constant teaching of the church, was a manifesto, a kind of incitement to a new approach to fundamental issues of human sexuality in the church, an approach which is revolutionary, that is, which is detached from what the church has always taught and practiced. There is no place in the Roman Catholic Church for revolution. We live in the tradition which has been handed down to us uh, from the time of the apostles. And, and the, the revolution, the major revolution which took place in the church uh, was the Protestant Reformation. And that's not what we're about. The confusion and error was first expressed in a presentation by Cardinal Walter Casper during the extraordinary consistory of February 20th and 21st of 2014. The heart of the extraordinary consistory was a lengthy presentation on marriage and the family by Cardinal Casper, which was followed by an intense discussion by the cardinals present. Cardinal Casper's presentation was quickly published in various languages and became a focus of a wide discussion, especially in the secular media. His presentation raised a number of serious questions about what the church has always taught and practiced regarding the indissolubility of marriage. It was based upon an interpretation of the fathers of the church and on the practice developed in the Eastern Orthodox churches. Clearly, his presentation called for a discussion which began in earnest during the extraordinary consistory itself. After the extraordinary consistory, a number of cardinals, including myself, decided to respond as fully and as profoundly as possible to the positions taken by Cardinal Casper. Five cardinals contributed to the study. We cardinals also called upon the help of Archbishop Cyril Vazil of the Society of Jesus, an expert in the practice of the Eastern Orthodox churches, Father Paul Mankowski, also of the Society of Jesus, an expert in the sacred scriptures, and Professor John M. Rist, an expert in the teaching of the fathers of the church. We also sought the help of Father Robert Dodaro, an Augustinian friar, president of the Patristic Institute Augustinianum in Rome, for the editing of the book. Apart from his tireless and highly qualified work of editing so important a volume in various languages, it was originally published in, in the five major European languages, English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. Now it's been published in other languages too. But Father Dodaro edited this book in the period of a few months so that it came out simultaneously in five languages. If you have any idea of, of what that took, he, he, I, he, was, he did a, a wonderful work. He attributes it all to Our Lady, by the way. He, he, he constantly told me that uh, I couldn't believe it. It, it. it needed to be done. It was urgent, and I trusted it would be done. But he said to me repeatedly, no, he said it's Our Lady who, who did it. And he also then contributed two very treasured editions to the book, 
a summary of the argument of the entire book so that when you read his summary, if you don't have time to sit down and read the whole book, you can f- see what's in each contribution and go to those things that you need to, to find first. And the, the, each contribution stands on its own. And then he also provides an appendix, which are excerpts from, the, from select documents of the magisterium, a very uh, a testimony to the fidelity of the church down the ages to uh, the teaching of our Lord in the gospel on marriage. The fruits of, of, the, of our efforts are found in the book, Remaining in the Truth of Christ, Marriage and Communion in the Catholic Church, as I said, published in English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish editions in time for the study of the Synod Fathers. As I've already mentioned, Father Dodaro, the editor at the very beginning of the book, gives a summary of the material presented in each of the eight essays which comprise the volume. The essays, in turn, present in a thorough manner the truth of Christ regarding the sacrament of holy matrimony as contained in the Holy Scriptures, as taught and practiced in the early church. They then address the particular practice of the Eastern Orthodox churches and its coherent coherence with doctrine, and the historical challenges uh, to the Lord's teaching recorded in the Gospels. The beauty of the truth of Christ and holy matrimony is then illustrated by presentations on the Church's theological doctrine and our moral teaching, this uh, by Cardinal Ludwig Gerhard Müller, the Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and Cardinal Carlo Cafara, the Archbishop of Bologna in Italy. The last two essays take up the safeguarding and fostering of the truth of Christ regarding holy matrimony in the Church's discipline, her canon law. I commend the book to your reading. While it is scientifically solid, every effort was made to edit the contributions in such a way that they would be accessible to the reading and understanding of serious Catholics and all persons of goodwill. The book has enjoyed a wide readership in the different language editions already published. Since the October 2014 Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, translations into the Polish and Slovak languages have been published. At present, translations into Croatian, Hungarian, and Portuguese are being prepared. The book is truly a point of reference for the most serious matter presently under under discussion by the Synod of Bishops. To assist you in your reflection upon the current discussion, which is the topic of this first presentation, I want to take up now several general considerations which are, in my judgment, key to understanding the situation in which the Church presently finds herself. I offer these considerations in the context of the sound teaching contained in the just-mentioned book. The first consideration is the relationship between faith and culture— Above all, as a presupposition of the discussion of holy matrimony in the current situation, it is important to have a correct understanding of the rapport between faith and culture. Many times during the discussions before the first assembly of the Synod and during the the actual sessions of that first assembly, and in this time of preparation, or in in the time of preparation for the second assembly, it has been declared that the Church must update its practice and, above all, its language in order to address herself effectively to a totally secularized culture. Some have gone so far as to assert that the Church can no longer speak of the natural law, intrinsically evil acts, irregular unions, and so forth. Their point is that the language itself makes the culture hostile. However, doing so, the Church gives the impression of wanting to draw near to the culture without a clear identity of her own self and of what she has to say to the culture. According to divine wisdom, the Church must always speak the truth with love. Yes, the Church should go to the peripheries of today's culture, as as Pope Francis is constantly urging us, but always secure in her identity, manifesting the greatest compassion which necessarily involves respect for the truth of the cultural situation, which many times 
is marked by confusion and error regarding the most fundamental truths of human life and its cradle, which is the family. The Church has to call things by their proper name in order not to risk contributing to the confusion and error instead of bringing it to light and order. There's a beautiful passage in Evangelium Vitae, the encyclical letter of St. John Paul II on human life, in which he talks about this, we call it politically correct language, euphemism, uh, with regard to abortion. And he says very clearly that we need to call things by their proper name, and then he, he says directly, abortion is murder. Honest people who live in such a culture have a thirst for the truth and for its proclamation with charity. To encounter the protagonists of such a culture without manifesting the truth of Christ with clear words would be a serious lack of charity. For instance, we think of what the gospel tells us about Christ meeting with the people, that he found them to be like sheep without a shepherd, and that he therefore instructed them. We think also of the meeting of our Lord with a Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob or with the woman discovered in open adultery. Our Lord doesn't mollycoddle people. He's very, very kind and very compassionate, but he speaks very directly. The dialogue between himself and the Samaritan woman is very illustrative. The Lord is full of understanding for their situation. He pardons them, but at the same time, he is attentive to indicate to them the necessity of leaving a life of sin, the necessity of sinning no more. So that is the first uh, subject I wanted to address. All in the discussions in October of, of 2014 and, and since, oftentimes a discourse which was given by St. John the Twenty-Third on the opening day of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council is cited. The discourse is entitled Gaudet Mater Ecclesia, Mother Church Rejoices. And it, it, it isn't part of the magisterium. It's his own personal uh, expression of, of enthusiasm about the synod at its opening. And in it, in, I must say, in a naive way, and we can all be naive from time to time, he expresses a great confidence that if the church just represents again her teaching, that the culture is ready and waiting to embrace it. And so he, he's filled with confidence about the council. And there's no question that he thought that the council would take no longer than one session. Uh, just a question of holding up certain teachings of the church again. But what he didn't realize was that, was that there was already brewing in the culture the fruits of, of philosophical errors which had come from earlier centuries, uh, German idealism and rationalism, and which had also sadly infiltrated the church was under the surface and with the whole uh, cultural turmoil of the 1960s erupted in a way uh, that has, has been terribly damaging uh, uh, to the life of the church, such that if you, I'm often, I hope I get to do it, but wanted to write an article contrasting his speech at the opening of the Second Vatican Council and several texts of Pope Paul VI in the late 60s and 1970s in which he is clearly in anguish. The one that's most famous, and I'm sure you've heard it quoted, is the homily he gave on the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul in 1972, uh, in which he, he talks about, he said, we believed uh, that with the council we were ushering in a, a time of light and of freedom and of love. And instead, we find ourselves in a, in a darkness and that we, we delight in, 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 in going ever deeper into the darkness instead of, 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 of dispelling it with the light. And he, and he said, I, I, I sense that through some opening, some fisher uses the word, that the smoke of Satan has entered into the sanctuaries of the church. And there's no question he was referring to the, to the liturgical reform, which had gone very much awry. And so uh, 
uh, now, <laughs> curiously enough, uh, some of the proponents of this so-called new approach, revolutionary approach to marriage, were, were re- rejoicing that the church is returning to that spirit <laughs> of the Second Vatican Council. And whenever you hear that, you must be ab- absolutely attentive uh, because the spirit of the Second Vatican Council has nothing to do with the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, I can assure you. And, uh, and, and then quoting this, this famous address of, of, of Pope St. John the Twenty Third, I, can, uh, I am certain that the, that the saint uh, had no idea in, uh, when he gave that speech of what would actually happen. It, it's simply a question that can happen with anyone, any one of us. He, he misjudged the times. And uh, um, anyway... I must say, uh, I have been giving presentations I felt a particular urgency during this time in various parts of the world, and uh, I find that, that people who uh, uh, don't necessarily agree with me, and even secular people, they, they want to hear what the Church teaches. And I can assure you today, and in all these talks I've given, I have no new ideas of my own. All, all I have to present to you is, is what the church teaches you, and that's what will save your soul. My ideas will not, and, and you can be sure of that. And so, uh, uh, but I, I, this is my, uh, my experience, that, that people are really are longing to hear these things in a certain way. Um, uh, people are counting the, the Catholic Church in a certain way represents a last hope for the culture, which they, they people realize the culture is, is, is decaying. It, it, it's, it's, it, it can't, this can't last, this can't go on. It, it, it's, it's suicidal. The second topic is the confusion regarding the nature of the Synod of Bishops. Oftentimes, in popular presentations of the work of the Synod of Bishops, the impression is given that the Church's teaching and practice will be altered by a majority vote of the Synod Fathers. But the Synod of Bishops has no authority to change doctrine and discipline, none whatsoever. The nature and purpose of the Synod of Bishops is described in Canon 342 of the Code of Canon Law, which I will now read. The Synod of Bishops is a group of bishops who have been chosen from different regions of the world and meet together at fixed times to foster closer unity between the Roman pontiff and bishops, to assist the Roman pontiff with their counsel in the preservation and growth of faith and morals, in the preservation and growth of faith and morals, and in the observance and strengthening of ecclesiastical discipline, and to consider questions pertaining to the activity of the church in the world. The Synod of Bishops is not convened by the Roman Pontiff to suggest changes in the doctrine and discipline of the Church, but rather to assist the Roman Pontiff in safeguarding and promoting sound doctrine regarding faith and morals, and in strengthening the discipline by which the truths of the faith are lived in practice. The next topic I want to take up is the risk of sentimentalism. Reflecting upon the situations of profound suffering in families which find themselves outside of the context of the truth of Christ, there is the risk of falling into sentimentalism, which, while it seems compassionate, is deeply harmful because of its lack of respect for the objective situation of the persons involved. Such sentimentalism blocks the encounter with Christ on the part of the person who is in sin. Sentimentalism sees the truth of Christ as something hurtful to the person and thus does not speak the truth, which is the only way for the person in his time to abandon the sin in question. Sentimentalism also fails to respect the profound effect of the irregular situation of the person on so many other persons bound to him by relationships of family or friendship. Concentrating ourselves exclusively on the painful situation of the individual, 
We do not see reality in its integrity and thus bring about injustice not only to the individual but to the others bound to him. One of the examples of this of this sentimentalism is a hearkening to what's called the injustice done to the children of parents who are in an irregular union. As if the word of Christ, the teaching of Christ, and the indissolubility of marriage is causing an injustice to these children. And that's said frequently. And if people don't think very deeply, they can kind of get emotionally worked up about that and say, well, yes, we should then let these these parents be fully uh, uh, admitted to the sacraments. Yes, the children are in, are in a situation of suffering, but it's owed to the, the sin of the, of, of the breakdown of the marriage and, and, and of the entering into a, an, an invalid uh, matrimonial union. It's not due to the teaching of Christ, and, it, and it's no remedy to the situation to water down or to, or to falsify the teaching of Christ. I liken it to parents with children. Uh, When a a child does something very wrong, uh, a parent has to be firm, loving, but but firm. And firmness is what leads uh, to correction. And all of us have seen what happens in families where this kind of sentimentalism, this, uh, this false compassion is constantly excusing the, the errors of children and their misconduct and so forth. And, uh, and the children, uh, uh, instead of growing up to be a beautiful uh, tree, turn out to be weeds in the sense of they're in, in all kinds of trouble uh, because they haven't received what, what they need. And all of us are the same way in the church. We need to hear the truth of Christ, the truth of the moral law, in order to develop into who we really are. The third, maybe it's the fourth, I don't know. Anyway, (laughs) the next topic is the radical modification of the process for the declaration of nullity of marriage. Uh, Speaking of... Thank you, Father Elias. Speaking of the temptation of sentimentalism or false compassion... I would like to say a word about the quite widely publicized proposal, and now it's actually come to be a a reality, uh, to modify radically the process for the declaration of nullity of marriage so that the parties in a cause of nullity could receive more easily and quickly such a declaration. Uh, I, uh, the Holy Father, as in the meantime, on September Eighth issued two motu proprios in which he has effectively uh, altered radically the, the process for the declaration of nullity of marriage. Notwithstanding that legislation, I, I want to illustrate a, a couple of principles which do not change with regard to declarations of nullity of marriage. I want to address the nature and substance of the canonical process for the declaration of nullity of marriage. In the last chapter in the book, Remaining in the Truth of Christ, I uh, treat that subject uh, with special reference to the situation in the United States. In his presentation to the Extraordinary Consistory and in other declarations, Cardinal Casper has asserted that the process for the declaration of nullity of marriage is not of divine law and therefore could be radically altered. He has suggested an administrative process, for example, a meeting of the bishop or of a priest delegated by the bishop with the party who accuses his marriage of nullity, on the basis of which the bishop would declare the nullity of the marriage. While it is true that the process in its individual elements is not of divine law, a process apt for the discovery of the truth about the, about the marriage accused of nullity is absolutely of divine law. The present process is a fruit of centuries of experience of the church in the just treatment of an accusation of marriage nullity, And as the Venerable Pope Pius XII brilliantly illustrated in his address to the Roman Rhoda, which is the tribunal of the Pope for uh, such causes of nullity of marriage, 
and other, other causes which are brought to him. In his address in 1944, uh, he uh, treated the various elements uh, of the process which adapt it, make it apt uh, for the discovery of the truth about situations of the breakup of marriage, which situations, I must say, in my experience, are normally quite complex. Uh, <clears throat> for, the most, for the more simple causes, for example, a case of a person who attempted a marriage when he was already bound to a pre-existing marriage, there is the documentary process already in the law with its appropriate speed. As I explain in, in my contribution to Remaining in the Truth of Christ, Marriage and Communion in the Catholic Church, to alter the actual process without respect for its historical development risks taking away from the process the possibility of arriving at a just conclusion, a judgment given with moral certitude according to the truth discovered by means of the process. And let me make clear to you what is the, the, the result of the process. A person comes to the matrimonial tribunal, the bishop. The bishop is the first judge in the diocese, but because these cases are complex and many bishops are not prepared to judge them, they rightly give this work to a priest and or priests whom they've sent to study, and also sometimes they have qualified lay persons and religious who work with them, uh, to judge these cases for them. What are they judging? They're judging an accusation of nullity of marriage. Someone comes forward and says, for instance, I accuse my nullity of marriage because either I or my partner excluded with a positive act of the will uh, the good of offspring. In other words, one of the parties, uh, by a positive act of the will, excluded procreation. There would be no children in the marriage. It could also be excluded the, the good of fidelity, that one or other of the parties intended with a positive act of the will to be unfaithful in the marriage. So the person brings forward that accusation. What the, the tribunal work then is to prove that that accusation has been demonstrated. And the final judgment is that it has been established that the marriage was null on this, this or that ground. For instance, the exclusion of offspring or the exclusion of fidelity or the exclusion of indissolubility. And there are other grounds as well. The church does not declare that the marriage is absolutely invalid. It can't. Only God knows that. And it it has some language which has come out from the Synod of Bishops has suggested it doesn't judge the validity of the marriage. In other words, if it gives a negative judgment, that's not a declaration that the marriage is valid. It's simply a declaration that hasn't been shown that it's invalid. So it's, it's a limited judgment which is humanly possible to be made with moral certitude. And uh, And and people who bring a cause of nullity to the church should have this in mind, uh, come with complete sincerity and honesty, knowing that God knows the truth about the marriage. Uh, They believe that it's null, and they leave to the, the church with her process to decide whether or not they've been able to establish that nullity. I hope that that may be somewhat helpful to you, but there are many misunderstandings in this regard. The next subject I take up is the fullness of power of the Roman pontiff and absolute power. In a similar way, some have suggested that the fullness of power of the Roman pontiff means that he is able to, to dissolve any marriage. Such a suggestion does not respect the necessary distinction between the fullness of power and absolute power. The fullness of power of the Roman pontiff is at the service of the truth of the doctrine and of the discipline of the church. The Holy Father exercises his power with total obedience to Christ and cannot make decisions contrary to the truth of Christ, appealing to an absolute and therefore arbitrary power. The discipline contained in Canon 1141 of the Code of Canon Law remains true also for the Roman Pontiff. This is how the Canon reads. 
a marriage that is ratum et, et consumatum, that is a marriage which has been contracted uh, validly and has been consummated with the conjugal act, can be dissolved by no human power and by no cause except death. It doesn't say except death or uh, or a decision of the Roman pontiff, because these are these are, are divine realities. This, it, no no Roman pontiff would want to, to to touch such a thing. The same discipline of divine law is contained in Canon 853 of the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches. It is clearly absurd to affirm that the Roman pontiff has power to change divine law. It's just an absurdity. The next topic is the relationship between doctrine and discipline. In what regards the canonical process for the declaration of nullity of marriage, it is frequently said that changes in the process can be introduced without touching in any manner the doctrine on the indissolubility of marriage. But it is evident that an inadequate process for arriving at the truth regarding a marriage accused of nullity would bring with it a lack of due respect for the indissolubility of holy matrimony. In fact, in the United States of America, our beloved homeland, from 1971 to 1983, a very modified process with the diminution of the figure of the defender of the bond and the effect of elimination of the double agreeing sentence, in other words, the checking of an affirmative sentence in first instance by a, a, a higher tribunal, it was permitted by the Holy See. With time and not without reason, the process for the declaration of nullity of marriage became popularly known as Catholic divorce. In other words, in the common perception, while the Church was declaring the indissolubility of marriage in its teaching, in its practice it was permitting parties held to a marriage bond to marry another person without having first demonstrated the nullity of the earlier marriage bond. I served for many years at the Apostolic Signatura, which has the responsibility for the right administration of justice in the Church and uh, supervises the work of over a thousand tribunals. Uh, first, I served there as defender of the bond from 1989 to 1995, and then as prefect from 2008 until November of last year. In a consistent manner, the experience of the Apostolic Signatura shows that when a matrimonial tribunal has well-prepared staff, the causes proceed without unjustified delays. At the same time, a process to reach a decision in so important and delicate a matter has of necessity its proper times for gathering the proofs, for examining them, and at the end, for giving a judgment with moral certitude by moral certitude, we mean that there is no reasonable doubt to the contrary. With sadness, many times I have seen that the diocesan bishop has not sufficiently taken care to prepare well the necessary personnel for his tribunal. In other words, it's not the process that has need of modifications, but the practice of some bishops who do not pre prepare do not provide well-prepared and just workers for their tribunals. It, it has to be clear, too, that it isn't a question only of having a degree in canon law, of being well-prepared in that sense, but it has to be a person of right doctrine. In other words, a person can use even canon law in a dishonest way to produce unjust decisions. And so uh, the bishop has to be careful that that he is, and first and foremost, that he has the priests who are working in the tribunal are of sound doctrine, and then that they have the knowledge of canon law in order to, to judge properly these cases. I'd now like to talk about a new evangelization and the family. The discussion of holy matrimony and of the family during the synod was presented in terms of evangelization. The frequent appeal of Pope Francis to the Church to go to the peripheries 
has, has as its scope the evangelization of the people who live at the peripheries. Such evangelization, according to the teaching of Pope St. John Paul II, leads us to attain the high standard of ordinary Christian living, which is found in the gospel and in the living tradition of the church. I commend very much to you the reading of the apostolic letter, which Pope St. John Paul II wrote at the conclusion of the celebration of the great jubilee of the year 2000, in which he uh, discusses uh, the program of the church in our time, which is the same as it has always been, holiness of life in Christ. And especially uh, you'll find in Numbers 29, I think, like 32 or 33, a wonderful reflection. As observed before, the synod, therefore, has the task of suggesting the ways for the church to be more faithful to the truth of marriage and of the family taught to us by the gospel and by the living tradition. Regarding Christian marriage and the family and the call to evangelization, already in the post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Familiaris Consortio, Pope St. John Paul II declared that the Christian family, in fact, is the first community called to announce the gospel to the human person during growth and to bring him or her through a progressive education and catechesis to full human and Christian maturity. Noting the multiple and grievous attacks on marriage and the family in our time, Pope John Paul II stressed the importance of witnessing to the truth about marriage and the family so that the family may evangelize the whole of society. He declared, At a moment of history in which the family is the object of numerous forces that seek to destroy it or in some way to deform it, and aware that the well-being of society and her own good are intimately tied to the good of the family— the Church perceives in a more urgent and compelling way her mission of proclaiming to all people the plan of God for marriage and the family, ensuring their full vitality and human and Christian development, and thus contributing to the renewal of society and of the people of God. In the present moment, when the attacks on matrimony and on the family seem the most ferocious, It is the church which must show to the whole of society the truth in all its richness, and therefore the beauty and goodness of marriage and of the family. The church accomplishes its mission of evangelization of the family with its teaching, with the celebration of the sacraments, and with the life of prayer and devotion, and with its discipline. I'll have the occasion in my last presentation to show how the church carries out this evangelization uh, through the sacraments when I talk about the preparation for the celebration of the rite of marriage and, and the rite itself. The church and therefore the synod must give special attention to the holiness of marriage, to the fidelity, to the indissolubility, and to the fecundity of the matrimonial union. Christian family life is necessarily a sign of contradiction in today's culture. The synod ought to be the occasion for the universal church to give inspiration and strength to Catholic couples for the witness to the truth of Christ of which our culture has such great need. The synod ought to be a help to Christian families in being, according to the ancient description, the church at home we call the domestic church, the first place in which the Catholic faith is taught, celebrated, and lived. The faithful living in a marriage in difficulty must certainly enjoy the particular attention of the church who, in imitation of the Savior, announces to them the truth of Christ and brings to them the grace of Christ to live faithfully and generously the marriage vocation to the end. In the same Familiaris Consortio, Pope St. John Paul II underlined the irreplaceable service of the family in the evangelization of the world. 
Citing the teaching of Blessed Paul VI, he declared, Blessed Pope Paul VI, he declared, to the extent in which the Christian family accepts the gospel and matures in faith, it becomes an evangelizing community. Let us listen again to Paul VI, and he quotes Blessed Paul VI. The family, like the church, ought to be a place where the gospel is transmitted and from, the gosp- and from which the gospel radiates. In a family which is conscious of this mission, all the members evangelize and are evangelized. The parents not only communicate the gospel to their children, but from their children they can themselves receive the same gospel as deeply lived by them. And such a family becomes the evangelizer of many other families and of the neighborhood of which it forms a part. It is clear that if evangelization is not found in marriages, in Christian homes and families, it will not be found in the church and in society. At the same time, marriages transformed by the gospel are the first and most powerful force for the transformation of society through the gospel and the living tradition of the church. Later on, I will reflect on a corollary question, which is of of critical importance to parents in the handing on of the faith and its practice to their children, namely the question of education. The next topic I wish to address is confidence in the natural law and in the grace of matrimony. Confronting the sufferings of individual persons and of families, the church should not lose its confidence in the natural law inscribed in every human heart and in its full expression in the saving work of our Lord. In our culture, there is a confusion about the meaning of human sexuality, which is bearing the fruit of profound personal unhappiness, which often leads to the breakup of marriage, to the corruption of children and young people, and ultimately to self-destruction. Disordered sexual activity, sexual activity outside of marriage, and the media's constant, powerful, and false messages regarding our identity as man and woman are all signs of the urgent need of a new evangelization which begins in marriages, in families, and through marriages reaches the entire culture. There is need of the witness to the distinct gifts of man and of woman who both dispose themselves to the service of Christ and of his mystical body by means of a chaste life. Christian marriage is the first place of such necessary witness in our culture. Children learn chastity first and foremost by the chastity of their parents, by the chaste manner in which their parents live the matrimonial vocation. By means of a sound family life, our culture will be transformed. Without sound family life, the culture will not ever be transformed. In the life of holy couples, we see reflected all of the splendor of the truth about the union of a man and woman in faithful and enduring and procreative love. In their life, we see above all the truth of the teaching of Christ in response to the Pharisees who were putting him to the test, posing the question of the possibility of divorce. The Lord responded to the Pharisees, teaching the observance of the eternal law according to which God the Father created man and woman. This is the response of our Lord. Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one? So they are no longer two, but one. But therefore God is joined together, let no man put asunder. When the disciples asked about the great exigency of the divine law for spouses, the disciples said, well, if it's that way, maybe it's better not to marry. (laughs) But the Lord responded that with the vocation to the married life, God grants an abundance 
the grace to live such faithful, enduring, and procreative love. Not all men can receive this precept, but only those to whom it is given. God always gives the grace, even to those who are the weakest, to live faithfully, the matrimonial state, if that is, is their calling. And the Lord also, it's very interesting in this passage taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, he talks also about celibacy in the same context, which today, too, people say this is impossible. No one can live this way. The Lord gives the grace for the building up of his holy, holy church. Father Paul Mankowski, at the conclusion of his essay on the Holy Scriptures in the book Remaining in the Truth of Christ, Marriage and Communion in the Catholic Church, writes, there was at the time uh, a debate between two groups in the the Jewish religion. Uh, One was seen to be more rigorous and one more lax with regard to the question of divorce. So this is what Father Mankowski writes, yet it is mistaken or if not wholly mistaken, seriously incomplete, to view Jesus as a disputant who championed the rigorous side of legal moral controversy. To reduce our Lord to an adherent to one part of a controversy. And whose appeal was, and is solely to the tough-minded. For he also promised a new and superabundant outpouring of grace, of divine help, so that no person, however fragile, should find it impossible to do God's will. It is this objective reality which St. Paul celebrates in the letter to the Ephesians with these inspired words. And I'd like to read this passage from Ephesians 5, verses 31 to 33. Uh, in a certain way, it, it, it is the, the great truth which we are uh, honoring throughout this day. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. This is to to draw attention to the intimacy of the matrimonial union. It's like the intimacy of our relationship with our own body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He quotes the passage from the book of Genesis. This is a great mystery. And I mean in reference to Christ and the church. By by mystery, we don't mean some puzzle. But we we mean a reality which is, is beyond our our, our full comprehension because it is a divine reality, and, and that is what holy matrimony is. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. How let, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The next topic I would like to take up is the natural law and the formation of the conscience in the family. So often today, a notion of tolerance of ways of thinking and acting contrary to the moral law seems to be the interpretive key, interpretative key for many Christians. Today's popular notion of tolerance is not securely grounded in the moral tradition, yet it tends to dominate our approach to the extent that we end up claiming to be Christian while tolerating ways of thinking and acting which are diametrically opposed to the moral law revealed to us in nature and in the sacred scriptures. The approach at times becomes so relativistic and subjective that we do not even observe the fundamental logical principle of non-contradiction, that is, that a thing cannot both be and not be at the same time. 
In other words, certain actions cannot at the same time be both true to the moral law and not true to it. That's a principle we could practice a lot more in our time. In fact, charity alone must be the interpretive key of our thoughts and actions. In the context of charity, tolerance means unconditional love of the person who is involved in evil, but complete abhorrence of the evil into which the person has fallen. I remember from my childhood, we were constantly taught, love the sinner, but hate the sin. But this notion of tolerance levels that, and so we end up, our love for the sinner turns out to be also, in in some way, an acceptance, hopefully not a love, of, of the sin itself. Fundamental to the Catholic life of virtue is the understanding of human nature and conscience. Critical to the deplorable cultural situation in which we find ourselves is the loss of the sense of nature and of conscience. Pope Benedict XVI addressed the question of the loss of a sense of nature and conscience with respect to the foundations of law in his address to the German parliament, the Bundestag, during his pastoral visit to Germany in September of 2011. Taking leave from the story of the young King Solomon on his accession to the throne, he recalled to political leaders the teaching of the Holy Scriptures regarding the work of politics. God asked King Solomon what request he wished to make as he began to rule God's holy people. The Holy Father, Pope Benedict, commented, What will the young ruler ask for at this important moment? Success, wealth, long life, destruction of his enemies? He chooses none of these. Instead, he asks for a listening heart so that he may govern God's people and discern between good and evil. The story of King Solomon, as Pope Benedict XVI observed, teaches what must be the end of political activity and therefore of government. Actually, what must be the end of every one of our thoughts and words and actions must flow from a listening heart that we discern good from evil, choose the good, and reject the evil. He declared, politics must be a striving for justice, and hence it has to establish the fundamental preconditions for peace. To serve right and to fight against the dominion of wrong is and remains the fundamental task of the politician, fundamental task of each one of us. Pope Benedict XVI then asked how, how we know the good and right which the political order, and specifically the law, are to safeguard and and promote. While he acknowledged that in many matters, this is referring to the world of government, the support of the majority can serve as a sufficient criterion, he observed that such a principle is not sufficient for the fundamental issues of law in which the dignity of man and of humanity is at stake. Regarding the very foundations of the life of society, positive civil law must respect, and I quote, nature and reason as the true sources of law. In other words, one must have recourse to the natural moral law which God has inscribed upon every human heart. What Pope Benedict XVI observed regarding the foundations of law in the concepts of nature and conscience points to the fundamental work of education, the work of developing in students the listening heart or developing in our children a listening heart which strives to know the law of God and to respect it by development in the life of the virtues. Time does not permit me to address the place of education in bringing the human person to full human and Christian maturity. Suffice it to say... Parents must be vigilant that the education given to their children be coherent 
with the Christian education and upbringing in the home. Even as the family is essential to a new evangelization, so also is education because of its intrinsic connection with the growth and development of the child in Christ. Today, one one cannot be vigilant enough. Uh, I'm sad to say, and I say it with a tremendous sense of regret, that many schools undo what the parents have have, uh, formed in their children in a a very radical and, and, and... in grave manner. And so any of you who are parents of children, I just ask you to be very attentive and to know fully if you are sending your children uh, to either public or Catholic schools, to know fully what the curriculum is and and what the life of the school is and whether whether it is coherent and supportive uh, of, of what you're teaching your children at home. The thoroughly galvanized anti-life and anti-family agenda of our time advances in large part because of a lack of attention and information among the general public. The pervasive mass media, the powerful promoter of the agenda, confuse and corrupt minds and hearts and dull consciences to the law written by God upon every human heart. In his encyclical letter on the Gospel of Life, Pope John Paul II declared, What is urgently called for is a general mobilization of consciences and a united ethical effort to activate a great campaign in support of life. Altogether, we must build a new culture of life, new because it will be able to confront and solve today's unprecedented problems affecting human human life, new because it will be adopted with deeper and more dynamic conviction by all Christians, new because it will be capable of bringing about a serious and courageous cultural dialogue among all parties. While the urgent need for such a cultural transformation is linked to the present historical situation, it is also rooted in the Church's mission of evangelization. The purpose of the gospel, in fact, is to transform humanity from within and make it new. Like the yeast which leavens the whole measure of dough, the gospel is meant to permeate all cultures and give them life from within so that they may express the full truth about the human person and about human life. What Pope John Paul II affirmed about the mobilization of consciences regarding the inviolability of innocent human life surely applies as well and as strongly to the mobilization of consciences regarding the integrity of marriage and family life. Pope John Paul II did not fail to note that such efforts must begin with the renewal of a culture of life within Christian communities themselves. The Church herself must address the situation of so many of her members who, even though they may be active in church activities, end up by separating their Christian faith from its ethical requirements regarding life and thus fall into moral subjectivism and certain objectionable ways of acting. I I don't have time to go into it this morning, but it's very important in, in educating our children to educate them in the truth about conscience. Today, by many, the term conscience is used to justify doing whatever I think. And the people say, well, that's, that's what you think, that's your conscience. My conscience tells me differently. Well, the conscience is oriented to the truth, which is one, and it's the same for all of us. And the, the, the conscience has to be well-formed, and when it is well-formed, then we don't... Uh, uh, on, on the fundamental questions, there should be no uh, disagreement uh, among us about what is the right and good thing to do. We live in a time, I've now come to the conclusion, lest you think that that was never going to happen. <laughs> I, I could say more, actually, but uh, I have my limitations, and I'm sure that you have your limitations, too, in sitting on those hard benches. We live in a time when the fundamental truth of marriage is under a ferocious, indeed, I would not hesitate to say, a diabolical attack. 
I'm very convinced about that. <laughs> Which seeks to obscure and sully the sublime beauty of the married state as God intended it from the creation. Divorce is a commonplace in society, as is the pretension to remove from the conjugal union by mechanical or chemical means its procreative essence. And now society has gone even further in its affront to God and his law by claiming the name of marriage for liaisons between persons of the same sex. I refuse to refer to these, certainly I don't refer to them as matrimonial unions or marital unions, and I do not refer to them either as sexual unions because this is not human sexuality. It's, and we, we shouldn't use that kind of language. And I also don't refer to traditional marriage because there's only one marriage. There's not traditional marriage and some other kind of marriage. So uh, I, I understand the term, and it's actually beautiful because it's marriage according to the, to the tradition in the sense of from the beginning. But I'm afraid today, by using that, that terminology, we give space to people who say, yes, but we, there's another kind of marriage that you're not uh, considering. Even within the church, there are those who would obscure the truth of the indissolubility of marriage in the name of mercy, this false compassion that I talked about, sentimentalism, or who who would condone the violation of the conjugal union by means of contraception in the name of pastoral understanding, and who in the name of tolerance would remain silent about the attack on the very integrity of marriage as the union of one man and one woman. There are even those, too, and I've heard it, who deny that the married receive a particular grace to live heroically in faithful, enduring, and life-giving love. We're we're all called to be heroes. It's not just for a few uh, special people. It's, It's the call. All of us are called to live that extraordinary nature of of our ordinary Christian life. Our Lord himself has assured us that God gives to the married the grace to live daily in accord with the truth of their state in life. And all, I'm not talking about some marriage under a bell jar, some uh, uh, cakewalk, some uh, bowl of cherries. We all know, in, in each of us in our own vocation, the hardships, the trials, the temptations, the difficulties Uh, sometimes profound sorrows which come to us. But what we know even more is that constant presence of our Lord with us, with his grace, which sustains us. And even in the moments of the greatest weakness, uh, in the moments of the greatest trial, wins his victory in us. In our day, the witness to the splendor of the truth of of marriage must be limpid and heroic. We must be ready to suffer, as Christians have suffered down the ages, to honor and foster holy matrimony. Let us take as our examples St. John the Baptist, St. John Fisher, and St. Thomas More, who were martyrs in defending the integrity of of the fidelity and indissolubility of holy matrimony. In the face of the confusion and error about holy matrimony, which Satan is sowing so widely in our society today. Let us follow their example and let us invoke their intercession so that the great gift of married life and love will be ever more revered in the church and in society. In the second conference, I would like to present Father John Anthony Hardin's Catechesis on Marriage and the Family. There is no question that Western culture is suffering a severe crisis regarding marriage and therefore regarding its fruit, the family. The May referendum in what has been called Catholic Ireland, in which an overwhelming majority of those voting legislated to define as marriage a liaison of two persons of the same sex, followed by the June decision of the United States Supreme Court, which imposed the same definition of marriage on the whole nation, 
are shocking manifestations of the gravity of the crisis. These actions, won by the general general population of Ireland and won by the highest judiciary authority of the United States, defy the law which God has written upon every human heart from the beginning. By them, man in his pride presumes to remake nature, to define created reality in a manner radically opposed to the will of the Creator. Succumbing to the same temptation by which our first parents fell from original grace, man presumes to be God and thereby introduces profound confusion, violence, and death into his life. These lawless actions at a national level reflect a disordered way of thinking which has entered into homes and local communities and is having a devastating effect on the lives of individuals and families. The crisis of marriage and the family in the culture is also having its effect in the church. In a false understanding of the relationship of faith and culture, some in the church maintain that the church must accommodate teaching and discipline to such radical thinking and acting instead of calling them to conversion. Some maintain that the church must change her language and even her teaching as presented in the Catechism of the Catholic Church in order to reflect a greater openness to the contemporary culture. The situation has so far deteriorated that a critical and public document of the last session of the Synod of Bishops devoted to marriage and the family insisted that the church recognize so-called positive elements in extramarital sexual relations and an attempted sexual activity between persons of the same sex. The fierce discussion over the Church's constant teaching and practice on the indissolubility of marriage in accord with the natural moral law and the unequivocal word of Christ is emblematic of the gravity of the crisis. The discussion centers on the denial of the sacraments to persons living in an irregular union, that is, persons bound in marriage to one person uh, who are living in a marital way with another person. In other words, persons who are living in an adulterous relationship. The church in fidelity to the teaching of Christ, namely that he who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, has understood that persons in an irregular union may not receive the sacraments until they are able to rectify their situation in accord with divine, natural, and revealed law, either by separating from each other or, if this is not possible, by living chastely as brother and sister. Concentrating on the suffering of some individuals whose marriage partner has abandoned them and who have subsequently attempted to marry another, some church leaders, for example, Cardinal Walter Casper, insist that in certain cases the church should admit to the sacraments individuals in an irregular union. They claim that the practice would be limited to a few cases, which would be decided not by the usual canonical process for arriving at the truth of a claim of nullity of marriage, but by an administrative process or pastoral conversation during which the local bishop or a designated priest or the parish priest would simply decide that the individuals involved were truly repentant of their situation and thereby disposed to receive the sacraments. The proposal is heavily laden with sentimentalism, with dwelling upon the sadness of the situation of certain individuals. The Church does not deny the sadness. In my 40 years of priestly life, I have consistently witnessed the Church giving special pastoral care to those who find themselves in an irregular union, according to the evangelical wisdom expressed by St. Augustine, love the sinner but hate the sin. I remember from my childhood, I grew up in a rural community. We were dairy farmers, and one of the farmers who lived not far from us and who was a friend of my parents was in an irregular matrimonial union. He he and his wife were at Mass every Sunday. They never approached to receive Holy Communion. And I remember when I was old enough to recognize this, uh, of course, in those days, uh, Others did not approach to receive Holy Communion either. 
either because they hadn't kept the, 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 the fast or because they were in a state of mortal sin. Uh, now we have this idea that if, that if you're at Mass, you, you, you must be able to receive Holy Communion like, like it's some kind of right that you have. Uh, I mean, it's really strange thinking. But in any case... When I was old enough to, to recognize it, I asked my father about it, and he explained to me the, the situation in an appropriate way, and I understood it didn't strike me as anything uh, strange, and, and certainly my father seemed very serene about it, and the, the parish priests always treated them with the greatest respect. They took part in, in parish activities, and in fact, uh, I have to say I admired them in a certain way because they, they were, in, 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 by not approaching to receive the sacraments, being honest about their situation. And so I, I, I just think this idea that now for the first time the church is being compassionate with regard to people who are in irregular matrimonial unions, I, I just don't understand it. I... The proposal, however, denies objective reality the person in an irregular union is either bound in marriage to another and therefore living in adultery, or is not. If that person can be admitted to the sacraments, then either marriage is no longer indissoluble, or adultery is no longer a mortal sin, indeed among the gravest of sins. Yes, the person involved may be sad about the situation, but repentance what has been called the penitential way is not a matter of mere sadness about one's sin, but of a firm purpose of amendment. If a person is not determined to cease living in adultery, then how is the person disposed to receive the sacraments? When our Lord pardoned the sin of the woman caught in adultery, he was clear in his command to her that she should sin no more. One must not be naive about the wide implications of a practice which contradicts the objective state of sin. If a person living in a public state of adultery can be judged by means of a pastoral conversation to be disposed to receive the sacraments, what about persons living in a public state of cohabitation or of sodomy? And there's no question. People say, oh, uh, your eminence, you're paranoid. No, I'm not paranoid. I... I <laughs> I have my eyes wide open. I wish it were otherwise, but we, we have to face the facts. In fact, during the time since the discussions surrounding the not denial of the sacraments to those in irregular unions, that is, from the time of the extraordinary consistory of cardinals in February of 2014, of the preparation and celebration of the first synod, first session of the Synod of Bishops on the Family in October of 2014, and in the time of the preparation of the second session, which is now in progress, uh, I have heard from bishops and priests in various countries that faithful living in irregular unions or cohabiting outside of marriage or living in a public homosexual liaison are simply people who are in these situations are simply demanding to receive the sacraments, demanding to be recognized uh, uh, publicly in the church, because according to them, the church has changed her teaching and practice. Without exaggeration, the situation could not be more critical. If the church's teaching on marriage, on the first cell of her life, falls into error, how can she any longer teach with authority on any other matter? There can be no question that one of the serious reasons for the present confusion and error is the poverty or non-existence of sound catechesis in many parts of the church for the past five decades at least. <clears throat> many even among church leaders speak and act in a manner which contradicts what the church is always and everywhere taught and practiced. If the present crisis is to be overcome, as indeed it must be overcome with the help of God's grace, then the catechesis on marriage and the family must be complete and clear. 
Catholics must be prepared to give an account of the truth, which is the foundation of the right order of society and of the Church. For that reason, I thought it would be helpful today to review the Catechesis on Marriage and the Family of the Servant of God, Father John Anthony Hardin, of the Society of Jesus, a master catechist who was deeply conscious of the dil- dilatorious effects of a faulty or vacuous catechesis and labored tirelessly to catechize and to prepare others, especially members of the lay faithful, to catechize. In presenting Father Hardin's catechesis, I'm using the basic home study course manual of the Father John A. Hardin uh, basic Catholic catechism course in its revised and updated edition published by Eternal Life in Bardstown, Kentucky in 2012. It contains his systematic exposition of the Church's teaching on marriage and the family, which he also presented in other writings, for example, the Catholic Catechism and the Modern Catholic Dictionary, and through his audio recordings. The Virtue of Chastity. The foundation of the Catechesis on Marriage and the Family is the Catechesis on the Virtue of Chastity, found in Father Hardin's treatment of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. The virtue of chastity orders human sexuality in accord with the truth that sexual union is by nature conjugal. That is, it belongs exclusively within the union of a man and woman in marriage. That's it. It's all right there. <laughs> so, the one flesh of the sexual union that beautiful phrase from the book of of Genesis, is in fact the full expression of the marriage covenant. Father Hardin points out how the sixth and ninth commandments of the Decalogue, the articulation of the natural moral law, are essentially related to one another, and how the sacredness of the body, especially in its sexual dimension, is elevated, is endowed with divine grace through the mystery of the redemptive incarnation. He writes... The Church, and I'm quoting Father Hardin, the servant of God, the Church regards human sexuality as a gift to be cherished. In taking our human nature upon himself, Jesus elevated the totality of the human person, including the body and human sexuality, to a supernatural plane. Our our bodies are sacred. As a consequence of the salvation won for us by Christ, Our bodies have become the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. In the words of St. Paul, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells within you? Precisely because our, our bodies are sacred, the Sixth and Ninth Commandments call us to safeguard bodily purity in imitation of the purity of Christ. The virtue of chastity is to be practiced by everyone, married and unmarried alike. Furthermore, it requires prayer and constant effort at every stage of life. The practice of chastity by the married, which forms a home in which freedom and happiness reign, even in times of great suffering, is the first school of purity and chastity for children. In the chaste relationship of their parents, children are able to identify rightly their sexual identity, and to respect its essentially conjugal meaning. Quoting the teaching of Pope St. John Paul II, Father Hardin points to the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the manifestation of the first fruits of the bodily resurrection of all humanity, as the reflection of the sacredness of the human body as it is recognized and honored in a pure and chaste life. The assumption reveals purity of mind and body as the way to freedom and happiness in this life and to the perfection in the life which is to come. Our body, too, is destined for glory. And our Lord himself, by taking our human nature, by taking a human body, and by his passion, death, his resurrection, and his ascension to the right hand of the Father, manifests to us the, the deepest reality of 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 our life, body, and soul. 
Father Hardin quotes extensively the teaching of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council and the Papal Magisterium of Pope Pius XI in his encyclical letter, Casti Canubi. I recommend that very highly to you. It's, uh, it's, it's too much forgotten in our day. It's, it's a very uh, illustrious presentation of what the Church has always taught about marriage. End of Pope St. John Paul II in his many writings on marriage and the family, illustrating how the expression of cha- how the primary expression of chastity is the respect for the conjugal act. It's really true. It's only when we come to recognize our human sexuality as essentially conjugal in its meaning that we have the strongest reason uh, and at the same time receive the uh, the grace to be chaste and pure. Father Hardin writes, the marital act, that is sexual intercourse, is legitimate only between spouses within the bond of marriage. Sexual intercourse seals the covenant relationship between a husband and wife. Without the covenant, there is nothing to seal. Under such conditions, the use of sexual intimacy to unite an unmarried man and woman in the most intimate way possible, seeks to confirm a relationship that is non-existent. Intercourse without marriage falsifies the inherent meaning of the sexual act as an expression of the mutual self-giving love, fidelity, and commitment between a husband and a wife. And that's why people who engage in, in, uh, in, in the conjugal act outside of marriage in the depths of their heart, experience a profound shame. The conjugal act is so integral to the covenant of holy matrimony that the church, that church discipline permits the Holy Father to dispense a couple from the covenant, that is, the matrimonium ratum, the, the, the covenant is sealed in the act of consent, but it, it awaits then its consummation uh, through the conjugal act. Uh, and the Holy Father does have the power to dispense uh, someone who is uh, in a marriage which has not been duly consummated. The practice does not call into question the validity of the, of the marriage of persons who, in imitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph, live as hus- husband and wife while both observe a vow of perfect continence. There are such marriages called Josephite marriages in in which a couple enter marriage with the the intention of, and not because they're against having children and so forth, but with the intention of imitating the the marriage of of the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph. On the other hand, a ratified and consummated marriage cannot be dissolved by any human power Uh, but by death alone. Regarding the practice of chastity within marriage, Father Hardin emphasizes that the marital embrace, the conjugal union, is an essential aspect of living out the sacrament of matrimony, which includes the responsibility to help one another to grow in holiness. He then presents two fundamental expressions of marital chastity. First, Marital chastity requires that every conjugal act must remain open to new life because sexual pleasure, which is isolated from its unitive and procreative purposes, is intrinsically disordered. We talk about the unitive and procreative purposes as if they were too uh, unrelated, but they are in the conjugal act, the two are essentially related to one another because the act is of its essence. It makes the, the couple one flesh, and it generates, is capable of generating new human life. It doesn't mean that it always does, but, but that, that it's, that's the meaning uh, of the act. It is the capital sin of, of, of lust that, to, to engage in, in, in the marital act without respect, uh, to take sexual pleasure uh, while isolating the sexual act from its unitive and procreative purposes. In a more extensive treatment of the sin of contraception, later in the chapter on the Sixth and Ninth Commandments, Father Hardin, echoing the teaching of Blessed Paul, Pope Paul VI, in his encyclical letter, Humanae Vitae, 
illustrates how the contemporary widespread practice of con contraception has led to a breakdown of family life and to the spread of other forms of sexual vice. He writes, at its root, contraception is sinful because sexual pleasure is sought while deliberately excluding one of the divinely intended purposes of sexual pleasure, which is the conception of a child. God himself commanded our first parents and through them tells all married people to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. While some form of contraception was practiced from ancient times, it was not until the 20th century that scientific methods were discovered to create what may be called a contraceptive culture. Contraception leads to the breakdown of family life, reduces marriage to a form of self selfish cohabitation, degrades the status of women, encourages homosexuality, and creates a climate for the murder through abortion of so-called unwanted children. Uh, as I'm sure you know, that all of the Christian uh, denominations uh, taught the intrinsic evil of contraception until 1930, when the Anglican Church at the Lambeth Conference admitted uh, the possibility of practicing contraception morally. That pressure came from the society and from this development to uh, which Father Hardin makes reference, scientific methods to, uh, uh, to make possible contraception. Uh, the Anglican Church uh, ceded to it. Gradually, then, the other churches, one by one, uh, ceded to it. And in the end, it was the Catholic Church alone which uh, was holding to the... the what the church has always taught about contraception. And then in the 1960s, there was a tremendous force uh, to have the Catholic Church change, change its teaching. There was this commission formed first by Pope St. John the Twenty Third, and, and then continued under Pope Paul the Sixth, and they gave the report to him. And uh, actually, the, the, the majority report was for the church to relax its teaching but the, the clear activity of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Pope understood that the majority was wrong. And, and, and he reaffirmed what the church has always taught and practiced. It cost him a tremendous suffering, but it's probably the singular uh, most heroic act uh, and demonstration of the, the Petrine office during his pontificate. Clearly, children who understand that their parents engage in contraception are formed in an attitude toward their human sexuality, which denies its essentially conjugal and procreative nature. They are formed to think that sexual activity can be devised according to their own desires and pleasures without respect for its objective nature. Uh, I'm, I'm horrified, and had been from the time I was first ordained 40 years ago, uh, certain parents uh, blatantly giving contraception, contraceptives to their children with the presumption that they were going to engage in fornication or, or, or adultery. Uh, this is a, is a supreme form of, of corruption of, the, of family life. Certainly the homosexual agenda in our time has argued that just like contraceptive sexual union between a husband and wife, the genital activity between two persons of the same sex expresses true love, even though it is not open to procreation, as indeed by nature it cannot be. I refer to homosexual activity as genital and not sexual, because by definition, a truly sexual act is conjugal in nature. So with this... Uh, opening of that question of contraception, you know, like Pandora's box. And, and we've just been insult, assaulted by a whole breakdown in, in family life and, and, and by uh, an increase in sexual promiscuity, sexual vices that is, 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 is stunning. Father Hardin, in the last part of his treatment of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments, takes up the question of natural family planning. 
Time does not permit me to present his full catechesis on natural family planning. In summary, the use of natural family planning when it is not selfish and is not a refusal to cooperate with God's plan to bring new life into the world is morally right because unlike contraception, it does not contradict nature by deliberately interfering with the natural life process. And I'm quoting Father Hardin there. The second expression, that, that first expression just treated, the second expression of, match, of marital chastity is spousal fidelity and mutual respect. Father Hardin presents the constant teaching of the church with these words. In her wisdom, the church teaches that extramarital sex is grievously contrary to the personal dignity of each spouse, which demands the respect due to persons made in the image and likeness of God. It demands the proper use of the gift of human sexuality, which is ordered by nature to the good of the spouses as they beget and educate their children. It follows that adultery, which is the indulgence in sexual pleasure with a third person, is forbidden. Adultery is an affront to the bond of marriage and an injustice to the partner whose trust has been betrayed. It is damaging to the children who need the security of a stable family life. And finally, it is harmful to society. Towards the end of his treatment of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments, Father Hardin provides a brief catechesis on true conjugal love. He calls to mind how two virtues of the early Christians converted the Mediterranean, charity and chastity. He immediately observes these virtues will also convert modern-day pagans to Christ. He shows how the two virtues are essentially related to one another. Marital chastity is integral, integral to charity, which excludes all selfishness and therefore the betrayal of the conjugal union through adultery. Another way of saying this is that the true love is always pure. Now, his treatment on the sacrament of matrimony. Lesson 14 of the Basic Home Study Course Manual is devoted to the sacrament of holy matrimony. The focus of Father Hardin's catechesis is marriage and its fruit, the family, as the first cell, the irreplaceable foundation of the life of society. Quoting the extensive teaching on holy matrimony in the pastoral constitution Gaudium et Spes, the church in the modern world, of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, Father Hardin writes, This striking quotation from one of the documents of the Second Vatican Council reaffirms the church's unchangeable doctrine on the meaning and purpose of the sacrament of marriage, more properly called matrimony. The effects of this sacrament on family life was powerful enough in the early years of the church to convert the pagan Mediterranean world, something to which I just referred, which witnessed the fidelity of Christian spouses to one another until death. It saw their rejection of contraception and abortion. It saw their virtuous family life. The countercultural witness of Christian marriages then, as now, gave witness to the truth of Christ's assertion to his followers. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. This is the, the situation of the church in many of the, the early cultures, the, the catechizing, evangelizing the, the barbarians and so forth. Uh, uh, it, it was simply by living in fidelity to Christ that tremendous conversions took, took place. And many of us uh, are deeply indebted to that early evangelization because we're descendants from those uh, peoples who were, who were catechized by such great figures as St. Boniface in, in Germany or St. Patrick in Ireland, St. Jordan in, in Poland. I could think of so many examples. Rightly, Father Hardin sees the catechesis on holy matrimony as key to addressing the whole of Christian life with integrity and to correcting the attacks on marriage and family in our time. 
Fittingly, Father Hardin underlines, above all, the powerful grace given by Christ to the married for their own salvation and for the salvation of the world. He writes, Given the contemporary host of discords in society, it is not surprising that the Second Vatican Council should teach us more than any other general council in church history about the supernatural power contained within the sacrament of matrimony. It is a power capable of producing the same type of selfless love which converted the pagan world in the early years of the church. Father returns to that very often, and rightly so. His catechesis presents holy matrimony under eight aspects. First, marriage at the dawn of the human race. Second, institution by Christ. Third, meaning and conferral. Fourth, the spiritual effects of the sacrament of matrimony. Fifth, recipient and minister. Sixth, mixed marriage and disparity of cult. Seventh, annulments and impediments. Uh, that word annulment, I should have caught that. Uh, that really is not the right term to use. People use it all the time, but it's very inadequate. The correct term is declarations of nullity. And eighth, separation and divorce. These aspects are ably treated in ten pages of dense catechesis. My time here this morning does not permit me to address, address each aspect. I will concentrate on the most fundamental aspects which are called into question by the contemporary crisis of marriage in the family, in the world, and in the church. Father Hardin fittingly begins with the treatment of what nature herself teaches us about marriage, the leaving of home by a man and a woman in order that they may, with the help of God's grace, form a new home. They leave their proper homes to become one flesh to cooperate with God in the forming of a new family. What nature teaches us, what is written on every human heart, is revealed in sacred scripture, in the magisterial teaching of the church, and indeed in the very bodies of man and woman. There can be no contradiction, in fact, between what God has revealed through nature and what he has revealed through his inspired word. There can be no conflict between nature and grace, which both have their origin in God, which both reflect his truth, beauty, and goodness, in which he has given his creatures a share. Man, above every other earthly creature, participates in the, in the being of God, for God has created man, male and female, in his own image and likeness. The natural sacrament of marriage, instituted by God from the beginning, suffered the effects of original sin, from which Christ has saved us by his redemptive incarnation. The second person of the Most Holy Trinity, by taking our human nature, purified and elevated matrimony, raising it to the dignity of a sacrament. So ma marriage is both a natural sacrament because God intended it from the beginning to be a participation in his uh, pure and faithful and enduring love. And it's also one of the seven sacraments. Our Lord uh, raised it to that dignity. He did that in order that spouses could more readily and fully live in accord with God's plan for them from the very beginning. Father Hardin explains, To Christian spouses, Christ offered the assistance of his grace. By elevating marriage to the dignity of a sacrament, he made possible a healing of the discord between man and woman and the restoration of the beauty and purity of the union of a husband and wife. One of the first manifestations of the effects of original sin was that Adam and Eve were ashamed before one another. And we see that disorder had entered into their hearts, and therefore there was this sense of shame. The fathers of the church commonly recognized that by taking an active part in the wedding feast at Cana, at the onset of his public life, and at Our Lady's urging, the Savior sanctified Christian marriage. The sacrament of matrimony enables people who are naturally selfish and hard of heart, and all of us have a bit of that in us, to become selfless and loving. 
And that's that mystery to which St. Paul refers. <laughs> By natural, Father Hardin refers to our fallen nature. He later explains the tendency to be self-centered, a consequence of concupiscence, is a potential threat to all marriages. Uh, here it's important. We've referred to marriage as a, a natural sacrament, but according to the right order, the beauty and, uh, and truth with which God created us. Sometimes when we refer to a, a marriage, a natural marriage, in the sense of affected by the by original sin. So it's important to, to distinguish those two uh, uses of the word natural in connection with marriage. The catechesis on the sacramental grace conferred on the spouses is key to addressing the present-day confusion within the church. In a totally secularized society, the tendency is to view marriage... <coughs> Excuse me. The tendency is to view marriage from a purely natural point of view in the sense of fallen nature, and then to reduce the teaching of Christ on holy matrimony to the expression of an ideal which is impossible for most to attain. So you have this notion of natural where we, we just simply condone uh, the evil effects of original sin, and then we say, well, there's this ideal which a few special people uh, may attain. But Christ, faithful to his promise, remains always in, with us in the church, with each one of us. His Holy Spirit indwells in our hearts. He never ceases to pour forth in abundance divine grace into our hearts, so that we can live in him in every fiber of our being, in every dimension of our lives, no matter how fragile uh, we may be. Centering his catechesis on the reply of Christ to one of the many attempts of the Pharisees to trap him, namely their argument, the Pharisees' argument that Moses permitted divorce and remarriage, Father Hardin explains... Our Lord's reply is key to understanding his reason for instituting the sacrament of matrimony. For your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. It is due to hardness of heart that Moses allowed divorce. Hardness of heart causes one to be self-centered and selfish. Marriage requires just the opposite, selflessness. Consequently, married couples must be on guard against any tendency to selfishness. In raising the marriage contract to the level of a sacrament, Christ provided the grace married Christians need to live fully their vocation. Catechesis regarding marriage necessarily is centered on the teaching of Christ, which is accompanied by his grace to live the truth set forth in his teaching. In that regard, too, young couples in the preparation for marriage and so forth, there should be great insistence on the importance of daily prayer, regular confession, and, of course, uh, participation uh, in, in the Eucharistic sacrifice every Sunday and more often when possible. In treating the meaning and conferral of holy matrimony, Father Hardin underlies, underlines that marriage is the most basic of all human institutions, that it is the foundation of the family, which is in turn the bedrock of human society, and that all other human institutions somehow depend upon the family. Holy matrimony is the faithful, lifelong, and procreative union of one man and one woman. By its very nature, it excludes adultery, unnatural sexual expression, and sexual intercourse, which is not open to life. By nature, marriage is a voluntary contract between a man and woman who mutually agree to live together as husband and wife for the rest of their lives, to accept children as God intends, and to be faithful to one another until death. Excuse me. As Father Hardin immediately indicates, 
The notion of a marriage between two persons of the same sex is a contradiction in terms. While two persons of the same sex might, may be united by the love of friendship, they cannot be united by spousal love. In the words of Father Hardin, it is not possible, according to nature, for two persons of the same sex to be one flesh. In such a relationship, genital actions are expressions of the vice of lust. The marriage contract is by nature sacred, having been established by God as the natural means of uniting a man and a woman and of procreating and educating his sons and daughters. Thus, even before Christ raised holy matrimony to the dignity of a sacrament, marriage always involved not only the two partners, but also God as the author of marriage. For this reason, the marriage contract is also called a covenant to indicate how from its institution at the beginning of human history, it typifies both the covenant between God and the entire human race, and in particular, the covenant between Christ and the church. This is what is meant when marriage is called a natural sacrament. Given the nature of marriage as both a natural sacrament in the Old Covenant and a sacrament endowed with supernatural grace in the New and Everlasting Covenant, sealed in the blood of Christ, the Church distinguishes marriages in the following way. First, the valid marriage of two, baptism, two baptized persons is a sacrament. Baptism, even if received in a Christian community which is not in full communion with the Catholic Church, disposes the individual member of the faithful to receive the sacramental grace of holy matrimony. Second, the valid marriage of two unbaptized persons is not a sacrament in the sense of the sacrament of holy matrimony, such a marriage can be called natural or legitimate. If subsequent to the marriage, one of the parties is baptized and the other party refuses to live in peace with the Christian party, in accord with the inspired teaching of St. Paul, the legitimate marriage can be dissolved in favor of the faith or by what is properly called the Pauline privilege. Thirdly, the valid marriage of a baptized party and an unbaptized party is a sacred union for the baptized party, but not a sacrament, for it is merely legitimate for the non-baptized party. If the unbaptized party refuses to live in peace with the baptized party, such a legitimate marriage can also be dissolved in favor of the faith by what has been properly, popularly called the Petrine privilege. What must be clear is that the elevation of a legitimate marriage to a sacrament does not constitute a new contract for the spouses. The marriage continues to be constituted by their original act of, marriage cons of marital consent. Neither does the validity of the marriage consent of the baptized depend upon the degree of their faith in the sacrament of holy matrimony. It has been suggested that many marriages are null because of a lack of faith or a lack of sufficient faith in the sacrament of holy matrimony. While such a lack may mean that one or both of the parties do not respond as fully as possible to the grace of the sacrament, it certainly does not render the marriage null. Father Hardin writes, both legitimate and sacramental marriages essentially consist in the matrimonial con contract or covenant, legitimate being a marriage between uh, two unbaptized persons and sacramental marriage between two baptized persons. Hence, the elevation of a legitimate marriage to the status of sacrament by Christ does not require a second con contractual agreement when the parties in a legitimate marriage are baptized, nor does the marriage contract between two baptized persons require anything other than their consent. The fact that both the spouses are baptized automatically makes the marriage contract, whether entered before or after baptism, a sacrament. In this sense, too, as Father Hardin points out, the ritual blessing of the priest or deacon who officiates at the rite of matrimony is not part of the essence of the sacrament of holy matrimony. 
Father Hardin goes on to explain that the essence of the sacrament of marriage is the mutual consent of the parties. The, the parties are the ministers of the sacrament. The matter of the sacrament is the total giving of self of the other to the other alone by the parties themselves, and the word of mutual consent is the form. Contained in the matter and form is the mutual handing over and the mutual acceptance of rights and duties over each other's bodies in view of the procreation and education of offspring and their mutual spousal love. The bond formed by the mutual consent is sealed by the grace of the Holy Spirit. The bond of marriage, in the words of the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, no longer depends on human decisions alone. The bond of marriage is therefore perpetual and indissoluble. Father Hardin comments, the bond of marriage is in fact an expression of God's perfect love for humanity. Surely the significance of the sacramental marriage bond is one of the greatest blessings of Christian marriage and its rejection one of the greatest curses for the entire human family. The marriage bond is perpetual and exclusive when consummated by natural, that is, non-contraceptive intercourse, it cannot be dissolved by any other authority uh, than Christ. Father Hardin then discusses the three essential goods of marriage, unity, indissolubility, and procreation. Given the current discussion in the Church, I present with some detail his treatment of indissolubility. I have already treated somewhat extensively procreation in the first part of my presentation on the practice of the virtue of chastity in marriage. Father Hardin begins his treatment of the indissolubility or permanence of marriage by reminding us that marriage, together with the priesthood, are the two basic foundations of the human social order. As world history demonstrates, when the indissolubility of marriage is not respected, society itself is destroyed. The fundamental importance of the indissolubility of marriage is clear from the Lord's own words in the Gospel, which St. Paul presents in the first letter to the Corinthians with these words. This is from chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, verses 10 to 11. To the married I give charge... Not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, let her remain single or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. Father Hardin then explains the nature of the dissolution of the matrimonial bond by means of the Pauline privilege and the Petrine privilege, explaining that such a dissolution is conceded by Christ himself and is therefore extrinsic to the intrinsic indissolubility of the marriages, which refers to the permanence of the bond which unites a husband and wife uh, from the moment of their consent and is exchanged in the rite of marriage until death do us part. He describes the intrinsic indissolubility of the marriage with these words, this bond cannot be terminated by an action of the spouse, such as mutual agreement or even sinful conduct as adultery, from within the marriage contract. Prior to the wedding, the spouses were free to marry or not to marry. However, once married, they are not free to terminate the bond. This internal indissolubility is a property of legitimate as well as sacramental marriage. So long as the marriage is valid, it is internally indissoluble. The Pauline privilege is granted by Christ himself through the inspired teaching of St. Paul. The Petrine privilege is an exercise of the power of the keys in the case of a marriage which is not sacramental in favor of a sacramental marriage. Regarding the exercise of the Pauline privilege and of the power of the keys in the case of the dispensation of a non-consummated marriage and the dissolution of marriage in favor of the faith by the Petrine privilege, Father Hardin provides a further explanation. He concludes, None of these concessions touching termination of the marriage bond 
extrinsically involves a marriage at the highest degree of perfection, a consummated sacramental marriage. And none of them concede any authority to the spouses to terminate their marriage, whether the marriage is sacramental or legitimate, valid, or consummated. In this way, the permanence of marriage as as God instituted it and as Christ dignified it as a sacrament of the new law remains intact. In the conclusion of his treatment of the indissolubility of marriage, Father Hardin recalls that the breakdown of the unity of the Church recalls the breakdown of the unity of the Church caused by a refusal to accept the word of Christ concerning the indissolubility of marriage. This is particularly illustrated in the case of King Henry VIII in 16th century England. Uh, it, the, the division of the church at that time had its cause in the adultery of the king. Also, in, we don't have time today to go into the practice in the Orthodox churches in which there is permitted what is called a penitential marriage. It's not really considered a true marriage for someone who's divorced and, and enters into a, a second union. Um, they use various terms. They call it penitential. Uh, um, but uh, the history of it is of emperors, the pressure from emperors who uh, were engaged in, in adultery and in, in irregular unions, pressuring the patriarchs in the Eastern Church to permit these kind of of uh, situations. He summarizes what he, history teaches us with these words. History has shown how difficult it can be, even for practicing Catholics, to live according to the high standards set by Christ for married couples, particularly his insistence on permanence. Nonetheless, Through the graces of the sacrament, spouses can be certain that our Lord will provide everything needed to live fully their vocation. Father Hardin provides a separate treatment of the grace conferred through the sacrament of holy matrimony. Time does not permit me to discuss all of the richness of the Church's teaching and practice regarding holy matrimony as Father Hardin treats them in his catechesis. He treats, for instance, the recipient and minister of the sacrament, mixed marriage and disparity of cult in marriage and declarations of nullity and impediments to marriage, separation and divorce. Conclusion. Father Hardin concludes his lesson on holy matrimony as he does each lesson in his basic Catholic catechism course by proposing spiritual practices in accord with the truth of the faith treated. In the case of holy matrimony, he proposes spiritual practices for those discerning the vocation to marriage, for those who are married, and for all the faithful. I conclude by summarizing the spiritual practices provided for each group. For those discerning the vocation to marriage, he first counsels, know the basic purposes for which God created marriage, the good of, of the spouses, particularly the ultimate good of helping each other at, attain eternal salvation and the procreation and upbringing of children. His final counsel is, to them is therefore rightly maintain premarital purity. For the married, after counseling prayer together, mutual forgiveness, regular as, access to the sacrament of penance, and participation in Sunday Mass always and in weekday Mass when possible, he recommends the learning of natural family planning in order that they more more perfectly fulfill their call to procreate and educate children. I'm sure that you are aware that natural family planning not only works to, to space the procreation of children, but has been very effective for couples who suffer from infertility in helping them to conceive a child. It, 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 it remains, when it's properly understood, uh, very pro-life and very pro-family. His final counsel is, learn to recognize and cooperate with the graces received in the sacrament of matrimony. These sacramental graces help spouses to live well their vocation so that their marriage bears everlasting fruit. 
To all believers, Father Hardin commends respect for and promotion of the sanctity of marriage among all, not merely among Christians. He specifically urges the encouragement and assistance of the married in carrying their crosses for their own good and the good of their children. Lastly, he counsels the safeguarding and promoting of the holiness of marriage by voting for candidates to political office who support privately and publicly the sanctity of marriage as instituted by God. The Harden is a gold mine of good counsel. It is my hope that my presentation of the Catechesis of the Servant of God, Father John Anthony Hardin of the Society of Jesus, has helped you to reflect more deeply on holy matrimony, to which St. Paul referred as the great mystery of divine love. I hope that it may also lead you, if you have not already done so, to enrich your understanding and active respect and support of the married vocation by following Father Hardin's basic Catholic catechism courses. Finally, I hope that it has illustrated the irreplaceable service of sound catechesis in addressing and remedying the pervasive confusion and error regarding marriage and the family in in popular culture and, sadly, also in the Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Queen of the family, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This final conference, we reach the highest and most perfect expression of our faith, namely the sacred liturgy and a consideration of the preparation for holy matrimony. The family is the incomparable fruit of the marriage of a man and a woman. In reflecting with you on the mystery of holy matrimony, I now concentrate on the pastoral care of those who are preparing for marriage as a key to understanding how best to serve pastorally the family. It is clear that the husband and wife who understand as fully as possible the grace conferred in the sacrament of holy matrimony and who faithfully respond to that grace will form a home which is indeed the domestic church, according to the perennial understanding of the church. They will form a strong and healthy first cell of the life of the church and thus build up the whole church, not only in their parish and diocese, but universally. I quote the teaching on holy matrimony in the dogmatic constitution on the church of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. In virtue of the sacrament of matrimony by which they signify and share the mystery of the unity and faithful love between Christ and the Church, Christian married couples help one another to attain holiness in their married life and in the rearing of their children. Hence, by reason of their state in life and of their position, they have their own gifts in the people of God. From the marriage of Christians, there comes the family in which new citizens of human society are born, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit in baptism, Those are made children of God, so that the people of God may be perpetuated throughout the centuries. In what might be regarded as the domestic church, the parents, by word and example, are the first heralds of the faith with regard to their children. They must foster the vocation which is proper to each child, and this with special care, if it be to religion." That's uh, taken from the Dogmatic Constitution, Lumen Gentium on the Church, and that is in number 11. 
Regarding Christian marriage in the family, Pope St. John Paul II, in his post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Familiaris Consortio, declared that the Christian family, in fact, is the first community called to announce the gospel to the human person during growth and to bring him or her through a progressive education and catechesis to full human and Christian maturity. And that, of course, has to do with helping each child in the family, the parents have a special responsibility to help the child to know his or her vocation in life. This has oftentimes been forgotten in these last decades, but this should be uh, very much in our minds as we're raising our children. And noting the multiple and grievous attacks on marriage and the family in our time, Pope John Paul II stressed the importance of witnessing to the truth about marriage and the family. And I, I quoted to you this, to you this morning uh, that text from Familiaris Consortio in which the Holy Father urged, especially at this moment in history, a very strong witness on the part of families. In the present moment, when the attacks on matrimony and the family seem the most ferocious, it is, as I stated this morning, the church who must show to the whole of society the truth in all its richness, and therefore the beauty and goodness of marriage and the family. The church accomplishes this mission of evangelization of the family with its teaching, and we've concentrated very strongly on that this morning, and now with, we take up with the celebration of the sacraments and with the life of prayer and devotion and with its discipline. The sources of my presentation are the sacred liturgy and the code of canon law. These two sources are the expression of the doctrinal truth of marriage as God created it from the, from the beginning. Attending to them, we will attend to that unchanging truth, which is a participation in the very being of God in his incomparable beauty and goodness. The sacred liturgy. The sacred liturgy, the public prayer of the church, is God's greatest gift to us. Through the sacred liturgy, the glorious Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, truly comes into our midst to purify our hearts of all sin and to inflame them with divine love. It makes present, therefore, the mystery of faith, the mystery of God's immeasurable and unceasing love for us, which reached its fullness in the redemptive incarnation of God the Son. Regarding the sacred liturgy, the fathers of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council declared, for it is in the liturgy through which, especially in the divine sacrifice of the Eucharist, the work of our redemption is accomplished. And it is through the liturgy, especially, that the faithful are enabled to express in their lives and manifest to others the mystery of Christ and the real nature of the true church. Uh, there are many examples in our own time of persons who have been uh, have received the first grace of coming into the full communion of the church or of conversion through uh, being present at the celebration of the sacred liturgy. The church is essentially both human and divine, visible but endowed with invisible realities, zealous in action and dedicated to contemplation, present in the world but as a pilgrim, so constituted that in her the human is directed toward and subordinated to the divine, the visible to the invisible, action to contemplation, and this present world to the city yet to come, the object of our quest. The liturgy daily builds up those who are in the church, making of them a holy temple of the Lord, a dwelling place of God in the Spirit, to the mature measure of the fullness of Christ. At the same time, it marvelously increases their power to preach Christ and thus to show forth the church, a sign lifted up among the nations to those who are outside, a sign under which the scattered children of God may be gathered together until there is one fold and one shepherd. Through the sacred liturgy, Christ bids us to give our hearts to him so that through, with, and in him, we may worship God in spirit and truth. 
from our hearts, united to his most sacred heart, flow rivers of living water for all our brothers and sisters. According to the ancient wisdom of the Church, the sacred liturgy is a privileged witness of the apostolic tradition. The Church's wisdom is expressed in an adage of Prosper of Aquitaine, the law of praying establishes the law of believing. We can add that the law of praying also establishes the law of acting. Since the sacred liturgy is the highest and most perfect expression of our life in Christ, we rightly turn to the sacred rites in order to understand more deeply the holiness of the Christian life in its every aspect. The sacred liturgy remind, remains the essential source of our understanding of the faith um, and of its practice in a good and holy life. Canon law. Canon law exists for one only reason, to safeguard and promote the sacred realities of our life in Christ. Pope St. John Paul II pursued with vigor the revision of the 1917 Code of Canon Law in order to fulfill the desire of the fathers of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council that the perennial discipline of the Church be addressed to the present time. Clearly, the Council's desire regarding Church discipline did not intend the, in the abandonment of her discipline, but a new appreciation of it in the context of contemporary challenges. In the Apostolic Constitution, Sacre Discipline Leges, with which he, the supreme legislator in the Church, promulgated the 1983 Code of Canon Law, he wrote, Turning our minds today to the beginning of this long journey, the journey of the revision of the Code of Canon Law, to that January 25, 1959, when my predecessor of happy memory, John XXIII, announced for the first time his decision to reform the existing corpus of canonical legislation, which had been promulgated on the Feast of Pentecost in the year 1917, and to John the Twenty-Third himself, who initiated the revision of the Code, I must recognize that this Code derives from one and the same intention, the renewal of Christian living. From such an intention, in fact, the entire work of the Council, the Second Vatican Council, drew its norms and its direction. These words point to the essential service of canon law, to our living in Christ with the engagement and energy of the first disciples. Canonical discipline is directed to the pursuit at all times of holiness of life. The saintly pontiff described the nature of canon law, indicating its organic development from God's first covenant with his holy people. He recalled the distant patrimony of law contained in the books of the Old and New Testament, from which is derived the whole juridical legislative tradition of the Church as from its first source. In particular, he reminded the Church how Christ himself declared that he had not come to abolish the law, but to bring it to completion, teaching us that it is, in fact, the discipline of the law which opens the way to freedom in loving God and our neighbor. He observed, Thus the writings of the New Testament enable us to understand even better the importance of discipline and make us see better how it is more closely connected with the saving character of the evangelical message itself. Pope John Paul II then articulated the purpose of canon law, that is, the service of faith and grace, and of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and charity. He noted that far from hindering the living of our life in Christ, canonical discipline safeguards and fosters our Christian life. He declared, its purpose is rather to create such an order in the ecclesial society that while assigning the primacy to love, grace, and charisms, it at the same time renders their organic development easier in the life of both the ecclesial society and of the individual persons who belong to it. As such, 
Canon law can never be in conflict with the church's doctrine, but is, in the words of John Paul II, extremely necessary for the church. The teaching of the church, in fact, is translated into discipline by the canonical tradition. He indicated four ways in which the church's discipline is a necessary complement to her doctrine, declaring, Since the church is organized as a social and visible structure, it must also have norms. In order that its hierarchical and organic structure be visible, in order that the exercise of the functions divinely entrusted to it, especially that of sacred power and of the administration of the sacraments, may be adequately organized, in order that the mutual relations of the faithful may be regulated according to justice based upon charity, with the rights of individuals guaranteed and well-defined, in order, finally, that common initiatives undertaken to live a Christian life ever more perfectly may be sustained, strengthened, and fostered by canonical norms. Because of the essential service of canon law to the life of the Church, Pope John Paul II reminded the Church that by their very nature, canonical laws are to be observed. And to that end, the wording of the norms should be accurate and based on solid juridical, canonical, and theological foundations. The Sacred Liturgy and Marriage in the current discussion regarding holy matrimony, and in particular its intrinsic indissolubility, it is frequently asserted that a great percentage of marriages are surely null. The reason given is the highly secularized culture in which we live. Secularization denies the natural law, which teaches us that marriage is a faithful, enduring, and procreative union, that it is a faithful and enduring union between one man and one woman. The argument is that many parties who exchange marriage consent today do not understand to what they are consenting and therefore exclude from their consent one or more of the essential goods of marriage, unity, indissolubility, and procreativity. Given the pervasive practice of no-fault divorce, it is, in particular, it is asserted that many parties affected by what is called the divorcist mentality exclude by a positive act of the will the indissolubility or permanence of the marriage bond. Whereas in the church's discipline, marriage always enjoys the favor of the law, that is, consent to marriage is presumed to be valid unless the contrary is proven with moral certitude, some today would hold that marriage consent in as many as 50% of cases can be presumed to be null or invalid. The first argument, in fact, against the presumption of nullity of marriage consent is human nature itself, as we were been discussing this morning. It is the law which God has written in every human part, heart, as St. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Romans. This is from chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. When Gentiles who have not the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. No one denies that a profoundly secularized culture has a negative effect on the giving of true matrimonial consent and on the living of the consent in practice. But that does not mean that young people today do not understand what marriage truly is and desire it in itself. To assert that they do not know the natural moral law is, in fact, to deny human nature, which teaches the truth about life, marriage as the cradle of human life, and our relationship with God, which expresses itself in worship of him. A second strong argument in the case of Catholics and non-Catholics 
who celebrate their marriages according to the rite of marriage in the Roman ritual is the reflection of the truth about marriage in sacred worship, and in particular, in the rite of marriage. In other words, the truth of the faith finds its highest and most perfect expression in the sacred liturgy. It is difficult, then, to comprehend how one can celebrate liturgically the sacrament of holy matrimony without understanding and embracing its truth, which finds its highest and most perfect expression in the liturgical rite. For that reason, I think it particularly important to consider the truth about marriage as it is expressed in the sacred liturgy, and in particular, in the rite of marriage of the Roman ritual. Although a second revised edition of the rite of marriage, reformed after the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, was promulgated by the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments on March 19, 1990, to the best of my knowledge, an official English translation has not yet been approved and printed. According to the degree of promulgation, decree of promulgation, the revised edition is richer in the introduction, in the rites and prayers, since some variations have been added according to the norms of the Code of Canon Law promulgated in 1983. Since the English edition of the rite of marriage in use, corresponds to the first edition promulgated by the Sacred Congregation for Rites on March 19, 1969, I will follow it. It is my hope that soon the official English version of the revised second edition will be published. In any case, there is no contradiction between the fundamental content of the two editions, although the revised second edition, as the decree of promulgation indicates, is much richer in its contents, especially in the contents of the introduction. Also, it must be noted that the English translation of the first edition suffers from the defects of the translation method called dynamic equivalency, which were addressed by the fifth instruction on vernacular translation of the Roman liturgy, Liturgium Authenticum, published by the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments on March 28, 2001. First, I will treat the introduction, what is called the prenotanda of the rite of marriage, and then consider some of the individual elements of the rite. It is my hope that my treatment will show how the sacred liturgy is the greatest teacher of the truth about marriage and, therefore, a safeguard against an invalid celebration of the sacrament of holy matrimony through the exclusion of one of the essential goods of marriage. More fundamentally and importantly, it is, the liturgical rite itself, it, it is the source of grace for the formation of the family as the domestic church. The introduction to the rite of marriage. The introduction to the rite of marriage is divided into four parts, which treat the importance and dignity of the sacrament of matrimony, the choice of rite, the preparation of local rituals, and the right to prepare a completely new rite. I will consider them in turn. The treatment of the importance and dignity of the sacrament of matrimony provides four essential points of catechesis regarding marriage and then three exhortations to the priest who officiates at the marriage. The first point taken directly from the teaching of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council expresses the nature of marriage. It states, Married Christians, in virtue of the sacrament of matrimony, signify and share in the mystery of that unity and fruitful love which exists between Christ and his church. They help each other to attain to holiness in their married life and in the rearing and education of their children, and they have their own special gift among the people of God. Marriage, as the first account of creation in the book of Genesis makes clear, is a participation in the very life of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and therefore reflects the divine love for man, which found its consummation in the redemptive incarnation. 
The participation of spouses in divine love is expressed in two ways, in helping each other to grow in holiness and thus to attain eternal salvation, and in procreating and educating children made in God's own image and likeness. The first point concludes with the words of St. Paul concerning the distinct gift which the married life is in the church. The second point describes how marriage is constituted by the covenant or irrevocable consent which each partner freely bestows on and accepts from the other. Marriage is the only sacrament in which the the parties are the ministers of the sacrament to one another. The, The priest officiates, he witnesses their consent, but they are the ministers of the sacrament. It then articulates the fidelity and indissolubility which such a union by its very nature requires, and Christ's elevation of the marital union to the dignity of a sacrament, so that it might more clearly recall and more easily reflect his own unbreakable union with his church. In the third point, the married, the married are urged to nourish and develop their marriage by undivided affection, which wells up from the fountain of divine love, while in a merging of human and divine love, they remain faithful in body and in mind, in good times as in bad. The marriage share in divine love, which is faithful and enduring, the unity and indissolubility of their union, has its font in the very life of God communicated to them at the creation and brought to its perfection by the coming of God the Son in our human nature and by his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. The fourth point stresses the inherent ordering of Christian marriage to the procreation and education of children who are, and the text quotes a text from the the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, which calls the the procreation and education of children the ultimate crown of the love of spouses. The text declares, Therefore, married Christians, while not considering the other purposes of marriage less, of less account, should be steadfast and ready to cooperate with the love of the Creator and Savior, who through them will constantly enrich and enlarge his own family. The essential good of marriage expressed in this point must be given prime attention in a society which strives to exclude artificially the good of offspring from the conjugal embrace. The fifth, sixth, and seventh points are directed to the priest. The fifth point instructs the priest to illustrate the just described truths about marriage, both through his preparation of the couple for marriage and in his homily during the rite of matrimony. Actually, the contents of marriage preparation are found in the very rite in this introduction, and they should be what the priest is illustrating for the couple in their preparation, and then again, what he underlines in his homily during the rite. And and the homily is not an option. The, The priest must give a homily during the celebration of the rite of marriage. Such instruction, both in the pre-marriage preparation and in the homily during the rite, as the introduction indicates, will help the bridegroom and the bride to receive far greater benefit from the celebration. The sixth point, under the sixth point, now we, we, the fifth point was telling the priest, please use these elements for the marriage preparation and in your homily. Then the sixth point underlines for the priest the instructive or catechetical nature of the rite itself. And I quote it in its entirety. In the celebration of marriage, which normally should be within mass, certain elements should be stressed, especially the liturgy of the word, which shows the importance of Christian marriage in the history of salvation and the duties and responsibility of the couple in caring for the holiness of their children. Also of supreme importance are the consent of the contracting parties, which the priest asks and receives. The special nuptial blessing for the bride 
and the marriage and the married co- marriage covenant, and finally the reception of holy communion by the groom and the bride and by all present, by which their love is nourished, and all are lifted up into the communion with our Lord and one another. The central elements of the rite of marriage are thus indicated: the liturgy of the word, the exchange of consent the nuptial blessing and the participation in the Eucharistic sacrifice, which reaches its completion in the reception of Holy Communion, the incomparable fruit of the sacrifice. The marriage of two baptized Catholics finds its natural setting in the celebration of the Eucharistic sacrifice, which is the highest expression of our life in Christ and the perfect reflection of the divine life in which the married couple is called to participate. I must say I think that one of the unfortunate developments in the reform which took place in the sacred liturgy after the Second Vatican Council was a, a kind of, of casualness about the rite of marriage and also a very unhealthy uh, concentration on the, the personalities of the couples. I, I've, I've been present at marriages and in which there is, to put it plainly, a lot of carrying on about the about the bridegroom and the and the bride. This is strictly inappropriate. What is happening here is is a sacred uh, union is being formed, and the concentration should be on the reading of the Word of God. The homily should concentrate on the exposition of the of the Word of God, and and, and on what is about to take place. The consent. I mean, actually. Uh, I've been present at weddings in which the exchange of consent is done in a kind of uh, careless way with laughing and so forth. I mean, I can't imagine uh, what could be more more inappropriate, and a priest must certainly guard against that. And with the secularization being what it is today, it's true that, that some couples take very lightly the marriage ceremony. That's why you have to insist with them on confession the night before, and, and uh, I always, when I was a parish priest, gave them a very strict admonition about getting to bed early and especially about not uh, exaggerating uh, exaggerating in the use of alcohol and so forth. But I actually had the experience from time to time of wedding parties which arrived in the church uh, with, with, with alcoholic beverages I mean, this is so all of these things one has to be very concrete and direct today because unfortunately uh, we aren't our young people are not raised and catechized properly and and they can be caught up in the in the horrible uh, disdain really of the sacredness of marriage by our culture sorry to have gone off on that but <laughs> <laughs> The seventh point reads, Priests should first of all strengthen and nourish the faith of those about to be married, for the sacrament of matrimony presupposes and demands faith. In preparing couples for marriage, the priest should study the rite of marriage with them as a means to deepen their faith in general and their faith in holy matrimony in particular. This is especially important today because a couple can arrive, who are even two, two Catholics, and they may not know practically anything about their Catholic faith. I mean, that's just the sad tale of, of our time. And the priest, and they'll be impatient about this. Well, that's just fine. They can be impatient. But the priest needs to, to catechize them. It's for their own good. Hmm. Sometimes the question is, is raised, and I, I addressed that a little bit this morning, about how much faith is required to enter a valid marriage. The answer is the fundamental understanding of the reality of marriage as God created it from the beginning and the acceptance of the call to marriage in one's own life. The fullness of faith or perfect faith is not required. If it were, then it would be impossible for many to enter a valid marriage which is clearly contrary to the will of God. The faith of the couple, by their day-to-day cooperation with God's grace, will grow in perfection throughout a lifetime. For those of you who are married, I'm sure that your faith today has a much deeper 
uh, knowledge and, uh, and a, a much greater engagement than it did on the day of your marriage, and that is only natural and right. I, I trust, too, that, that, uh, that my faith is deeper, my c- commitment to the, to the priestly vocation is, is more, more ardent and, and engaged than it was on the day of my ordination. Not that it wasn't on the day of my ordination, but we, we grow and develop as we live uh, our vocation and surely the Christian spouses must intend what the church intends by holy matrimony, which is not different in its essence from the natural sacrament, although it is enriched and perfected by sacramental grace. If those intending to marry demonstrate that they do not intend to do what the church intends in witnessing the marriage, their marriage, then as St. As Saint John, Pope St. John Paul II instructed in Familiaris Consortio, and I quote, the pastor of souls cannot admit them to the celebration of marriage. Uh, That would simply be sacrilegious to admit a couple to celebrate marriage who don't intend what the church intends. Monsignor Cormac Burke, uh, in his magisterial commentary on the question, observed this is contained in a book which he wrote, a very fine book, The Theology of Marriage, Personalism, Doctrine, and Canon Law. He, he's not my relative. I'd be proud if he was, but I, I can't claim him. Uh, he was for many years a judge of the Rota, and not infrequently canon lawyers would say, oh, I've read many of your decisions, and I said, no, you haven't. <laughs> uh, But this is what Monsignor Cormac Burke wrote. John Paul II does not use the phrase, and he's talking about familiaris consortio, what the church does. Normally we say that about the sacraments. You have to intend uh, what the church does. And if you baptize intending what the church does when she baptizes, that makes the sacrament valid. But marriage is distinct because it's the parties who who are confecting the sacrament, who are who are realizing the sacrament. Uh, And there's not an external uh, involvement uh, on the part of the church. The priest witnesses it, but the parties, this has to do with the fact, too, that marriage is a natural sacrament. Uh, So John Paul II does not use the phrase, what the church does, quod facet ecclesia, but rather he speaks of what it intends. This indeed seems the only accurate way to refer to the matter, while the church does nothing in the sacrament, it, insofar as it is present or aware of the marriage taking place, no doubt intends something that two Christians marry. It intends, in other words, a marriage between two persons who are in Christ. The question is this. Do the spouses intend what the church intends? Do the spouses intend to marry in Christ? If they intend to marry... They do, because in virtue of their baptism, they are in Christ. They intend what the church intends, just as the church intends what they intend. And so they have a sufficient sacramental intention. It would not be accurate to say that the church wants them to be married as Christians, for they are Christians. Though one could say the church wants them to be married so as to receive help to be better Christians. The second subject of the introduction is the choice of right. There are two rights of marriage, the right of celebrating marriage during Mass and the right of celebrating marriage outside Mass. The first right is always to be celebrated for two baptized Catholics. It would be absolutely anomalous for two Catholics to want to have their marriage celebrated outside of Mass. I've had that request from time to time, and that does reveal a serious lack of catechesis. In the case of marriage between a Catholic and a baptized person who is not Catholic, normally the second rite is chosen because of the general impossibility of the non-Catholic party to receive Holy Communion. The the ordinary of the place can give permission for the use of the first rite in such a case but Holy Communion is not given to the non-Catholic party. In the case of the marriage of a Catholic and a non-baptized person, 
the second rite is always used if the, if the other party is not baptized. Whatever rite is chosen, priests should show special consideration to those who take part in liturgical celebrations or hear the gospel only on the occasion of a wedding, either because they are not Catholics or because they are Catholics who rarely, if ever, take part in the Eucharist or seem to have abandoned the practice of the faith. The rite of marriage, and many people come to the celebration of a marriage who wouldn't step foot in a church otherwise. And uh, uh, so there they are, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's time to address a word to them. The, the rite itself should speak to them, but a, 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 a word from the priest, and it doesn't have to be addressed to them explicitly, but by his very preaching and so forth, there will be a, an evangelization. The rite of marriage is the occasion for everyone to deepen his consciousness of the natural law and to refine his conscience in obedience to the truth written in his human nature. The Holy Scriptures and their exposition in the homily are particularly efficacious in illustrating divine truth revealed both by reason and by faith. Sometimes it was said to me, Oh, Father, don't bother with preparing that very careful homily. The bride and groom aren't paying any attention. So what I like to do then is give them a copy, and then one day they will pay attention if they weren't. <laughs> on the, but on the other hand, there's the whole congregation there, and it should be clear to the congregation what's happening. And if you simply engage in in you know in familiar talk about the personalities of the parties and their particular uh, ways and so forth, it's all lost. It's all lost. Of course, the whole matter of the celebration of the rite of marriage, as it is conducted by the priest, well, that was interesting. You know, excuse me a minute. Uh, in the in the extraordinary form of the rite of marriage. There is a prepared text for the homily. And actually, it's quite beautiful. Are you, you're a priest, I think. You, you must... No, you, you looked like a priest. To me. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, maybe you missed your calling. <laughs> Just, uh, um, there was a prepared text, and it's beautiful, and it illustrates all of these points. And I sometimes used it in celebrating the ordinary form because it, it's really not, it's hard to do better. But in any case, uh, the whole matter of the celebration of the rite of marriage is, as it is conducted by the priest acting in the person of Christ, head and shepherd of the flock in every time and place, should manifest the divine reality present. The manner of the priest should reflect the truth that it is Christ who unites the couple in the sacrament of holy matrimony through their mutual exchange of consent. The section on the choice of right provides other liturgical norms and concludes with a strong emphasis on the liturgy of the word, which is part of both rites of marriage. And in both rites, both within Mass and outside of Mass, the, the liturgy of the word, the homily, the exchange of consent, and the nuptial blessing are, are all uh, integral to the right. Um, there's a section then on preparation of local rituals, and it treats possible adaptations of the right of marriage, which are suitable for the customs and needs of individual areas. Uh, this has to do mo mostly with missionary areas, and such adaptations must be recognized by the apostolic see. What is clear is, and th what the 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 introduction makes very clear is that the essential parts of the rite of marriage must be preserved even if their arrangement is varied. Regarding the cases of nations which are undergoing a first evangelization, according to the introduction, whatever is good and is not indissolubly bound up with superstition and error should be sympathetically considered and, if possible, preserved intact. The introduction makes it clear, however, that anything admitted into the liturgy itself must ha harmonize with its true and authentic spirit, namely, uh, of, of the divine reality. Such decisions clearly must be made with the greatest care and consideration, taking into account the principles of the liturgical rite 
and the profound meaning of any element taken from the pagan culture. Uh, today, for instance, in, in, in some places, there was a great uh, uh, urging of using local dances or like, what do they call it, liturgical movement um, uh, in the liturgy. And I remember that there was at the beatification of a blessed a trees of Calcutta, a certain dancing. And I remember the, an, an Indian archbishop visiting me in St. Louis who, who expressed, I expressed to my wonderment and that Mother Teresa of Calcutta was not someone who was a favoring liturgical dance. And I expressed my wonderment, and he was very agitated because he said the dance that was introduced, which was from their local Indian culture, he said was full of pagan uh, meanings and it should never have been should never have been used in the in the sacred liturgy. I have to be very careful about these things. The last section of the introduction, right to prepare a completely new rite, allows the conference of bishops to draw up a rite of marriage which must be approved by the apostolic see. One condition is given: the rite must always conform to the law that the priest assisting at such marriages must ask for and receive the consent of the contracting parties, and the nuptial blessing should always be given. Uh, I think here, uh, even today, uh, in the church, sometimes couples want to make up their own uh, exchange of consent. No. Um, because uh, the, the, the words of consent are very carefully uh, formed to express the essence of the exchange which is taking, taking place. And, and once we get into all kinds of, of other language, it's, it's just trouble. And then there, there's a question, too, about a marriage in the home, uh, uh, it, which is a practice in some places uh, here in, in, in this country, uh, oftentimes Again, at the influence of the secular culture, people want to have marriages by the riverside and or in the park and or somewhere else, and that's simply, uh, generally speaking, never permitted. The marriage should take place in the church. It's a sacred celebration, and uh, that's the, that's where it should be celebrated. Um, the I would like to just comment on one thing that comes to my mind that uh, I hope to uh, have done a, an article on this, which I hope to publish, but it's sometimes asserted uh, by people that that St. Joseph and the Blessed Mother were not married at the time of the Annunciation. I even found this uh, assertion in a in what was normally speaking a kind of popular catechetical text, and which is was... Uh, fairly sound in every other respect. And, you know, people say, well, Mary was the first unwed mother. Uh, Mary and Joseph were fully married. According to the Jewish ritual, there were two stages of marriage, but the first stage constituted the marriage, and they were considered married. That's why in the Gospel of Matthew, when our Lord discovers that Mary uh, is with child, he considers to divorce her, to put her aside. Well, if he wasn't married to her, he wouldn't need to divorce her. And so, uh, but people confuse today these two, <laughs> these two stages. People conf- confuse these two stages of the Jewish wedding practice with what we call engagement in marriage, and that wasn't it at all. The first part was called betrothal, but it was marriage. And it's the, the couple were married, the contract was fully binding, and then at some time, not too much later, then they they took up uh, their, their uh, common house, their common home. So I just want to make that very clear to you in case any of you have heard this said. It, it, it simply is, is, is not true. And in this article, which I hope to publish, there are many beautiful aspects that uh, uh, to be drawn from uh, the the insistence on the marriage of of the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph. Now, uh, just a brief treatment of the central uh, elements of the rite of marriage. 
The first of the central elements of the rite of marriage is the liturgy of the word, which is usually composed of three readings. The first reading from the Old Testament, a reading from the New Testament books other than the Gospels, and a reading from the Gospels. Be a very easy first reading that we had today, the Gospel that we had today, and from the New Testament, the letter to the Ephesians chapter 5. Wouldn't that make a beautiful set of readings for, for the for the wedding. But you could also have the wedding feast of Cana for the gospel. Uh, the rite of marriage, in fact, contains a selection of recommended scriptural texts. Given the importance of the choice of scriptural texts to instruct the hearts of the faithful and quicken their faith, special provisions are made for the selection of the texts. And it's even permitted on some Sundays, if a marriage is taking place on a Sunday and it's not a, taking place at the parish mass, uh, and it's not one of the major solemnities of the church year, then the rite even per- permits on a Sunday to choose the special readings for the rite of marriage. And, of course, they're always all from the Holy Scriptures. And then the rite of marriage requires the homily of the priest with these words. After the gospel, the priest gives a homily drawn from the sacred text, He speaks about the mystery of Christian marriage, the dignity of wedded love, the grace of the sacrament, and the responsibilities of married people, keeping in mind the circumstance of this particular marriage. In other words, the homily should be centered upon the action of Christ in the rite of marriage, uniting the couple in faithful, lifelong, and procreative love, and conferring upon them the grace to live fully the mystery of that love. The second central element is the heart of the rite of marriage, the questioning of the parties regarding their intention and the actual exchange of consent before God and his minister, the priest or deacon. The public nature of marriage is clear. It is a lasting state of life assumed in the church and in the presence of the church's minister and witnesses. In the introduction given by the priest, he declares... Christ has already consecrated you in baptism, and now he enriches and strengthens you by a special sacrament so that you may assume the duties of marriage in mutual and lasting fidelity. The priest then asks three questions which touch upon the essence of the consent in order to make clear its meaning before the parties actually exchange consent, sealing the covenant of their conjugal love. The last question regarding the acceptance of children can be omitted in the case of a couple who are advanced in years or in the case of a couple, one or both of whom are sterile. The questions are addressed to the parties by name, by both of their names. The question is, have you come here freely? You stay the person's name. John, have you come here freely and without reservation to give yourself give yourselves to each other in marriage. The second question, I mean, John and Jane, excuse me, have you come here freely? And the second question, will you love and honor each other as man and wife for the rest of your lives? Will you accept children lovingly from God and bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church? The questions leave no question regarding the nature of the consent which the parties are about to exchange. It would be very difficult to imagine that a couple who just responded to these three questions didn't know what they were doing. Marriage consent with its clear meaning of the giving and accepting of each other totally and for life can be exchanged either by each of the parties repeating the formula of consent or by the priest repeating the formula and asking each of the parties to consent with the words, I do. The formula reads, I, John, take you, Jane, to be my wife. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. The catechism, and then the same for the the bride. The catechism of the Catholic Church describes marriage consent with these words, inspired by the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world of the Second Vatican Council the rite of marriage, and the sacred scriptures. It draws from all these three sources, uh, from the sacred scriptures. They actually draw from the account of creation in the book of Genesis, the word of Christ in the gospel, and St. Paul's teaching contained in the letter to the Ephesians. 
This is the quote. The consent consists in a human act by which the partners mutually give themselves to each other. I take you to be my wife. I take you to be my husband. This, this consent binds the spouses to each other that binds this consent that binds the spouses to each other finds its fulfillment in the two becoming one flesh. Now that's uh, number 1627 from the Catechism. Through both the questioning before the exchange of consent and the exchange of consent itself, the marriage, the nature of marriage is clearly evident. It would be difficult to imagine someone not being able to understand the meaning of the words and therefore thinking that he is entering some other kind of relationship. In any case, the exchange of consent establishes the presumption of its validity. The contrary must be proven. The blessing and exchange of rings immediately following the exchange of consent gives powerful expression to the new reality constituted by God's grace. The two have become one flesh. The third central element of the rite of marriage is the nuptial blessing. It takes place after the Lord's Prayer. Three possible formulas for the blessing are provided in the English translation, while only one formula is given in the original Latin text. It is the first formula given in the English translation. In each of the formulas, God's blessing is called down upon the bride and her bridegroom in order that they may always respond more generously to the grace of the sacrament which they have just received. In all three formulas, two realities contained in the sacrament of holy matrimony are underlined. The grace to be faithful and enduring in love of each other as husband and wife, and the crown of their mutual love in the gift of children. The first formula reads in part, Father, keep them always true to your commandments, keep them faithful in marriage, and let them be living examples of Christian life. Give them the strength which comes from the gospel so that they may be witnesses of Christ to others. Bless them with children and help them to be good parents. May they live to see their children's children. The fourth central element is the participation in the Eucharistic sacrifice and the reception of its incomparable fruit, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. The mystery of divine love in which the spouses have been called to participate by an altogether special title, according to God's will from the beginning, is communicated most perfectly in the Eucharistic sacrifice. Listen to the words of the Catechism of the Catholic Church regarding the celebration of marriage. This is number 1621. In the Latin rite, the celebration of marriage between two Catholic faithful normally takes place during Holy Mass because of the connection of all the sacraments with the Paschal mystery of Christ. In the Eucharist, the memorial of the new covenant is realized, the new covenant in which Christ has united himself forever to the church, his beloved bride for whom he gave himself up, It is therefore fitting that the spouses should seal their consent to give themselves to each other through the offering of their own lives by uniting it to the offering of Christ for his church made present in the Eucharistic sacrifice and by receiving the Eucharist so that communicating in the same body and the same blood of Christ, they may form but one body in Christ. It is especially important that the priest emphasize both in the preparation of the couple for marriage and in the homily during the rite of marriage, the fullness of the meaning of the sacrament of holy matrimony, which is manifested in the Eucharistic sacrifice. The couple both experience the wonder of the gift of God's love in their lives by their oneness with Christ in his sacrifice and receive nourishment to live always faithfully in Christ, especially in moments of temptation and suffering. I don't take up the question of sacred music, and I underline the word sacred to be employed during the the rite of marriage. This was, in my experience as a priest, a a big challenge. Uh, And uh, uh, I remember one time we had very strict norms, which for which I was very grateful, at the cathedral parish in La Crosse where I was serving. And 
So I gave them about sacred music, too, because people can have the most inappropriate uh, music. One time a couple wanted the, a song that they heard when they first met in some bar, and uh, <laughs> it had nothing, no sacred content to it whatsoever, and I re- refused and gave them the norms, and <laughs> the young man was very ingenious. He went around gathering booklets from Catholic marriages around the area in which this song was permitted, brought them to me, but I told him that that wasn't, didn't prove the, the principle wrong. And so uh, <laughs> I'll just then uh, do this a uh, quick uh, part because it's getting close to our time. Uh, I have a, a section on canon law, uh, but I'll, I'll go through that a little more quickly. Um, Chapter 1 of Title 7, Marriage, of Part 1, The Sacraments, of Book 4, The Sanctifying Function of the Church, of the 1983 Code of Canon Law, treats pastoral care and those things which must precede the celebration of marriage. It is comprised of ten canons from Canon 1063 to 1072, which I will now treat briefly. The first, excuse me. The first of the canons, Canon 1063, provides the essential direction of the church's discipline regarding the pastoral care of the, of the married. Canon 1063 gives a general direction and then four means by which it is to be followed. The general direction reads, Pastors of souls are obliged to take care that their ecclesiastical community offers the Christian faithful the assistance by which the matrimonial state is preserved in a Christian spirit and advances in perfection. The pastoral care of the married is a principal work of the priest who provides it by engaging the whole community of the faithful. The pastoral care has two ends, the safeguarding of the integrity of the married state of life in accord with the word of Christ, and the fostering of the married state, so that those who are called to marriage correspond ever more perfectly to the grace received in the sacrament of holy matrimony. Among the responsibilities which belong in a special way to the pastor is the assistance at marriages and the giving of the, of the nuptial blessing. Canon 1063 continues by listing four special means by which the goals of the pastoral care of the married are to be attained. They are, one, preaching, catechesis adapted to minors, youths, and adults, and even the use of instruments of social communication by which the Christian faithful are instructed about the meaning of Christian marriage and about the function of Christian spouses and parents. Two, personal preparation to enter marriage, which disposes the spouses to the holiness and duties of their new state. Three, a fruitful liturgical celebration of marriage, which is to show that the spouses signify and share in the mystery of the unity and fruitful love between Christ and the Church. Four, help offered to those who are married, so that faithfully preserving and protecting the conjugal covenant, they daily come to lead holier and fuller lives in their family. The remote preparation for those who are called to the married state, and for all in the church who, no matter what their state in life may be, have responsibility for the care of the married, is a solid catechesis on marriage from the time of childhood and into adulthood. The proximate preparation of those called to the married state in life is given to them personally and disposes them to see the married life as their way to holiness, to eternal salvation. It also illustrates for them the particular responsibilities of the married. The immediate means of preserving the sanctity of marriage and helping the married to live ever more faithfully and generously the grace of holy matrimony is the liturgical rite, during which the couple administers to each other the sacrament of marriage by a mutual exchange of consent. For those who are married, pastoral care is directed to assist them in meeting the challenges of a lifelong faithful and procreative bond of love, especially in a totally secularized world. 
Such pastoral care has its inspiration in the grace of holy matrimony and remains always hopeful because of the grace which Christ never fails to give to those whom he joins together in the married life. Canon 1064 reminds the local ordinary, that would be the bishop and his equivalent, the vicar general, uh, of his responsibility to take care that such assistance is organized fittingly after he has also heard men and women proven by experience and expertise if it seems opportune. Given the fundamental importance of marriage as the first cell of the life of society and of, of the church, the local ordinary bears a most heavy burden of responsibility. Canon 1065 indicates the other sacraments which dispose the faithful to respond to the call to marriage. The sacrament of confirmation must be received before marriage so that the grace of the Holy Spirit first given in baptism is strengthened and increased for the effective witness to Christ in the world. The sacraments of penance and of the Holy Eucharist are the regular encounters with Christ by which the grace of baptism and confirmation is restored after sin and nourished by the gift of Christ's own body, blood, soul, and divinity. Special precautions. Canons 1066 to 1072 give a series of particular cautions in order that the sacrament of holy matrimony is celebrated validly and efficaciously. The pastor responsible for the preparation of the couple for marriage must make certain that nothing stands in the way of its valid and licit celebration. The pastor attains such assurance by means of a fitting investigation. Saint Canon 1067 assigns the responsibility for the establishment of the norms for the investigation to the Conference of Bishops and obliges pastors to follow them diligently before proceeding to witness a marriage. Canon 1068 provides for the case of danger of death and the case of an absence of proofs other than the declarations of the parties who are to marry. In such cases, the pastor is to seek the declaration of the parties that they are baptized and are prevented by no impediment. All of the faithful who are aware of an impediment are morally obliged to make them known before the celebration of marriage. If someone other than the pastor has conducted the prematrimonial investigation, then he must inform the pastor about the results as soon as possible through an authentic document. Canon 1071 lists seven situations of couples for whom the priest is not to assist at their marriage without the permission of the local ordinary. The most serious of these is the situation of a party who has notoriously rejected the Catholic faith. In such a situation, the local ordinary must make sure that the conditions for granting the permission for a marriage of mixed religion given in Canon 1125 have been fulfilled. Canon 1072 treats the case of youth who want to celebrate a marriage before the age at which a person usually enters marriage according to the accepted practices of the religion of the region. The canonical discipline safeguards and fosters the order of the sacred liturgy so that the beauty of the reality of holy matrimony as God instituted it from the beginning may shine forth for the salvation of the couple and for the edification of society in general. In addition, it provides a number of norms to provide as much as is humanly possible for a valid and licit celebration of the sacrament of matrimony and for an enduring and efficacious response to the grace received from the, through the sacrament. Conclusion. It is my hope that these reflections will assist you to consider the essential elements of the pastoral care of the married so that the church's care of those preparing for marriage and for the married may always respect the truth of the call to faithful, indissoluble, and procreative love, the call of a man and a woman to become one flesh. In concluding, I underline three essential elements of the pastoral care so needed in our time. 
First of all, attention must be given to a sound and complete catechesis about the sacrament of holy matrimony from the child from the time of childhood continuing into adulthood. <clears throat> While such catechesis has always been necessary, it is even more so in an age when so many contrary and false presentations of marriage are propagated by the mass media. Catechetical materials must be substantial in content, assisting the catechized to come to an integral understanding of the great mystery, which is holy matrimony. Second, the order of celebrating matrimony must be followed with the greatest care. The manner of celebrating must be filled with recognition that it is Christ himself who is present to join the couple in a faithful, lifelong, and procreative union. The prematrimonial instruction of the couple should include a careful review of the order of celebrating matrimony. The homily should be carefully prepared and should center upon the grace conferred with the sacrament, indicating the various ways by which the couple will remain faithful to the grace given to them for the salvation of their souls and the edification of the entire church. The central place of the exchange of consent and the nuptial blessing, and finally of the Eucharistic sacrifice for the marriage of two Catholics, should be carefully observed. Lastly, care must be taken for the juridical structure of marriage consent and the marital life, so that the Church witnesses only licit and valid celebrations of holy matrimony. The liturgical norms and the other norms of canonical discipline reflect the many centuries of the Church's experience in her pastoral care of those preparing for marriage and in her pastoral care of the married. The second revised edition of the Order of Celebrating Holy Matrimony is very much enriched by the norms of the 1983 Code of Canon Law. I conclude with the divinely inspired words of St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I think this may be the third time you've heard these today, but that's no harm done. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the Church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Amen. Th- Amen. <laughs> Thank you for your very kind attention. Uh, it's been a great... Uh, uh, <laughs> Thank you.